when did we last talk about this picture? I just want to look at all the numbers, the sheets of numbers. Um, last April 11th was the committee of the whole. Oh, right. Okay, I was looking at the wrong thing. Thank you. Uh, it's a okay. Look at them. Between 220 and 245, and then there's a tour of Perry Creek following. Check in on Thursday, maybe. Check in on Thursday. Richard, I'm going to mute you until you're ready to speak for public comments, okay? Okay, Mayor, we are ready to go. Thank you very much, Hope. All right, welcome back, everybody. And welcome to everybody in the public sphere out right there. We don't have too many in the hall, but uh, good to see you on the screen. This will be the revised agenda for the regular council meeting on Monday, April 25th, 2022. At the opening of the council meeting, we acknowledge with gratitude that we live and work on the traditional unceded territory of this Quahomish well nation, whose people and stewards of these lands and waters surrounding the Kuala Lumpur Island for millenniums. First item on the agenda is the approval of the agenda. Does anybody have anything that they'd like to add to? Uh, Agenda. Well, I just want to make note of the late, the on package. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. So we have that uh, 3.12, which is an addition of the Minutes of the Pennsylvania Bay Water System Local Advisory Committee. 6.1 are letters, I uh, leave some for the sewer. And the 8.3 is additional letters on the five year financial plan. Everybody got copies of those? Awesome. And uh, if nobody wants to change that, then the uh, the agenda will be approved by cons the uh, amended agenda will be approved, uh, the, uh, approved by consensus. Um, and we'll move on to public comments. Oh. Tonight we have two, starting with Mayor's School regarding the 2022 budget and the sewer bylaw. Okay. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Can you hear me okay? Absolutely. Good to see you. Okay. Thank you for your time this evening. Um, I just want to speak, uh, hopefully briefly, about the property tax increase, uh, proposed property tax increase, and the Sewer Cove Establishment Bylaw, the, sewer, the Snug Cove Sewer Establishment Bylaw. With regard to the property tax increase, um, I can only repeat what the whole community is saying, and you are receiving a number of letters about it, that a, a property tax increase of 10.4% this year and 10.74% next year is just outrageous, quite frankly. Um, you need to go back to the drawing table. You need to direct staff to look at the budget and bring in something that is a little more in line with what other municipality is doing. And that's something under 7%, preferably under 6%. I did a quick survey of lower mainland property tax increases and we've got Richmond 3.86%, Burnaby 2.95%, Surrey 2.9%, City of North Van 3.75%, District of North Van, North Van 3%, Port Coquitlam 3.64, and on and on. They are all under 5% with the exception of the city of Vancouver, which is 5.7%. I don't know how you as council can um, be accountable to the residents of this island and pass a budget that has a property tax increase of double anything, more than double anything that's in the lower mainland municipalities. Uh, it's evident that a number of municipalities, when I was looking through the Google, doing a Google search on this, have listened to the public and they reduced their um, property proposed increases. 
in response to comments from people. And I'm hoping that this council will do the same. We are living well beyond our means and someone obviously has dropped the ball when it comes to approving unlimited, unlimited spending on various projects. I don't know where that happened, but there is certainly a serious problem with the municipal finances. And I certainly don't lay this at the feet of Kristen Watson, whom I know um, from her uh, contributions when I was on council in 2008 to 2011, and certainly have a great admiration and respect for Kristen. And I think she's walked into a mess, uh, quite frankly, and I suspect she's trying her best to deal with it. But I am suggesting that you direct your staff, go back, find ways to reduce items in the budget and bring in a budget, bring in a property tax increase that's under 6%. I want to speak briefly about the Snug Cove Establishment Bylaw, as I know you've, the sewer bylaw, I know you've got that on the agenda with Kristen's report and you're not making the amendment. I'm not sure uh, quite how you're going to uh, resolve the matter of uh, taxing the island-wide residents with the cost of a sewer that's located in a local service area and that is supposed to be solely funded according to the bylaw. I've spoken about this before and I don't know whether there's kind of some um, smoke and mirrors that's going to be allowed to create a loan situation, but at the very least, I, su I suggest council needs to lay this out in detail as to exactly how the $921,323 will be apportioned amongst all the taxpayers of Bowen Island and why that justification needs to be laid out. I suggest maybe Gary's Corner would be a good place. We need it publicly, we need it presented, we need it to be very clear and you need to itemize exactly what your justification is for making taxpayers pay for the Snug Cove, all taxpayers pay for the Snug Cove sewer. Uh, that's it for tonight. Thank you for the time. And I implore you to listen to the people of Bowen and do something about reducing that property, proposed property tax increase. Thank you. Thank you, Nervous. Next, we have Richard Wolfsburg regarding item 6.1. Hello, Richard. Welcome. Yeah, thank you. And good evening, Mayor and Council. I am addressing the staff report under agenda item 6.1. Um, and two points in the report caught my attention um, amending, or more accurately, not amending the bylaw 10 2000 at this time, and the recognition of the need for strength and transparency and disclosure of transfers of money between funds. At close scrutiny, bylaw 10 2000 is actually a very well conceived document that regulates the operation, maintenance, repair, and funding of the Snug Cove Wastewater Treatment Plan. If it had been followed and properly supervised, if the mayor and council had held the management committee established by this bylaw to account, the current situation of the plan could have been avoided entirely. The key elements of this bylaw include the word solely to enshrine the user pace principle for the treatment plan, and that is appropriate. Other elements of the bylaw stipulate responsibilities and authorities of the management committee related, related to day-to-day -day oversight of operations, maintenance procedures, and so on. All of these functions and activities that were intelligently designed to keep the plant in a fit-for-purpose condition and in good work and order. Then someone came up with the bright idea to pay for the needed repairs with general funds. The well-conceived stipulations of bylaw 10-2000 were suddenly seen as an obstacle, in fact, rendering the funding plan illegal and in violation of the bylaw. The next bright idea was to simply change the bylaw and make it fit the funding plan. Take out solely, label the plan of unwise significance. Who could possibly disagree with that? Clearly that would fix it and green light the funding plan. And finally, why not change the scope of the original management committee and call it simply advisory committee? Altogether, rather drastic changes that leave not more than a hollow shell of the original bylaw 10 2000. All of it presented as seemingly doable and simply unavoidable in order to legitimize the use of general resources for special user interests. And now, on today's agenda item, this a proposal not to change the bylaw at all, a 
at this time, but still go ahead with an allocation of general reserves for a special user area. How does this approach not violate the terms of the active bylaw 10 2000? How is this not illegal? Further, how does this flip flop contribute to increased transparency? These zigzag maneuvers need to be explained in great detail in an open forum, transparently for the public to understand what council and staff are up to and to avoid further attrition of trust and confidence in this administration, if it can be explained at all. As it stands, the funding proposal that has been approved by council violates a bylaw which the council is obliged to adhere to and enforce. Me and council, by agreeing to this obf obfuscations, put themselves between the literary rock and a hard place. How they can possibly proceed in this way remains a mystery. This will come back to haunt them for sure. The only way out of this quagmire is to create a legally enforceable obligation for the special user area to pay back the entire bill for the repairs to the tune of 1.6 million and counting. And I mean every penny of it, and if it takes as long as 30 years. And there's just one more thing I wanna mention, now that we still have the original bylaw 10, 2000 in place, unaltered and in force, will mayor and council live up to their responsibilities and hold the Snuck Cove Wastewater Treatment Plant Management Committee finally to account. That's all I want to say tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. That's all for folks. All right, thank you all. Okay, we'll move on to consent agenda. Does anybody have anything they've heard? <laughs> Work clarification 3.4 Else. All right then. So uh, the recommendation is council approve the items as outlined in the April 25th, 2022 uh, consent agenda as amended. I'll move that. Thank you, Sue Allen. All in favor of it. Okay, so Allison will go ahead with that then 3.4. What do you know? Okay. Um, so I just want to clarify a couple of things. Um, it's a temporary borrowing bylaw. And then one of the things in the bylaw says the bylaw proceeds from the sale of debentures or so much thereof as may be necessary shall be used to repay the money so borrowed. So the plan was to borrow the money for five years, right? I believe so, yeah. Kristen? Yes. Yes. Short term borrowing is yeah. Um, so I'm I'm just a little confused then about the proceeds from the sale of debentures because that wouldn't be there's no debentures issued for the short term borrowing. But is that leaving the door open to extending the time for the repayment? Um, no, they have to go back and get um, a cent again to make it longer. Um, so. In this case, it should just be um, short-term, short-term debt that will be repaid in full over the course of the five years. So the, the clause four about the proceeds from the sale of debenture. I think it's unnecessary. Yes. Okay, so I just wanted to, but it doesn't clutter things up. I mean, there's no reason to remove it at this point. There won't be any sale of debenture. So yeah, we'll confuse people by having it there. I just want to note that it's in there. Solely because it's an MFA template for okay. the short term capital borrowing. So um, yeah. put it in. we can take it out, but I'm just saying that that's the reason that's it's their template. template. That's yes. why it's there. Okay. Then the other question that, that came up was there were some people at the information meeting that were asking about being able to pay the whole thing up front. So the short-term borrowing, we can pay off any amount we want at any time. Yeah, that's correct. So if somebody did want to prepay their uh, five-year annual personal tax, people they could the tax and do the next couple yeah, of weeks. Yeah, I could do a present value calculation of the five-year term over an estimated interest rate, and they could conceivably prepay that if they want. Well, if they're paying the whole thing up front, there's not that they're paying it, so there won't be any interest. So it would just be their share of the principal. Yeah, but we are doing that calculation through the $853 per year parcel tax. Well, so we can talk about the fine points of that one later. But at this point, we're just borrowing. It's, it's, we're not borrowing. It's not a debenture, and we can pay off anything we want at any time. 
it can be paid. So uh, if there's somebody out there that wants to pay me for the parcel tax gets actually calculated, they got to do it in the next week, probably. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I will move the bylaw number 558 2021 cited as Bowen Island Temporary Borrowing Bylaw number 558 2021. Be read at first, second, and third time. Thank you, Sue Ellen. And all in favor? Okay. We will move on. Delegations? We have none. Business arising from the minutes. So 6.1 is the information report where you snuck the Cove sewer establishment bylaw amendment. And over to Kristen Watson, Chief Financial Officer. Kristen, it's all yours. Thank you, Mayor Ander. I'll just um, kind of walk us through the process of how we got here. So uh, there was a special meeting held on July, uh, January 31st. And at that meeting, um, Bowen Island Municipal staff reported to council that wastewater treatment plant phase one upgrades were urgent and required and necessary. Um, at that meeting, staff, uh, council directed staff to proceed with issuing an RFP and that, um, that the capital project was to be funded uh, 1.6 million, 1,640,000, was to be funded 1 million uh, from the capital renewal and replacement fund and 640,000 from accumulated surplus. Uh, at a subsequent council meeting on March the 28th, staff brought forward a, um, a draft bylaw which proposed an amendment to the Snug Cove sewer specified area. And it was contemplated that, um, that perhaps the sewer establishment bylaw may require this amendment in order to align the wording in the bylaw that referenced the method of cost recovery with the use of um, general municipal reserve funds. At that same meeting, staff brought forward a second report to council that provided council with a rationale to be able to apportion the cost of the planned upgrades to specific um, development projects within the Snow Cove sewer specified area. And this report identified four projects in particular that had island-wide significance because approval of those projects advanced uh, strategic priorities that had been identified by council in, in their island plans over the previous five years. So 921,323 was apportioned to all the taxpayers island-wide and 718,677 have been apportioned directly to those property owners who live within the sewer specified area. And council accepted that cost apportionment and then they directed that staff impose a parcel tax and increase sewer rates on those properties in the sewer district only. Um, to fund the, the direct costs of the super specified area property owner's share that were not directly linked to these council strategic priorities. So it has since been determined that given that rationale and that, um, that model that has been provided as a clear allocation of costs between the local service area property owners and the island-wide property owners, <laughs> That, um, that there is no amendment required to the establishment bylaw. We, um, municipal funds will be spent on the municipal portion of the project and uh, local service area funds to be collected by way of a repayment plan over seven years will be used to fund the portion of the upgrade that's directly attributable to the specified area um, property owners. A second consideration of this um, proposed amendment was to address the need for strengthened transparency and disclosure of any potential transfers of money between funds. So this is um, this is a, an aspect that is not going to be addressed through this bylaw amendment, but um, staff will uh, bring forward by way of uh, updated and um, amended financial planning and reporting policy development work that will be undertaken later this year. And um, the, a, a, an improved and strengthened financial policy will be brought forward to council for consideration. So uh, at this point then, staff recommend 
the council not proceed with amendments to the Snapco sewer bylaw and that um, that cannot be considered at this time. Okay, thank you, Kristen. Any discussion, any questions for Kristen on this? Go ahead, Maureen. Can I just confirm that there's no resolution that needs to be? Uh, the resolution was to um, go to the relevant local uh, finance advisory committee and sewer specified area committee for comment. So that oh was God. the bill yeah. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to move the recommendation. Okay. Second. So the recommendation is oh, the council not proceed with the proposed amendment to the special sewer establishment bylaw number 10, 2000 at this time. All right, I've got a second over there for the discussion. And okay, see anybody, so all in favor, aye. Now we got uh, sort of a little bit ahead of schedule. Is Daniel here or somebody going to take it? It's on the screen. Okay, it's on the screen. There he is. Okay, so the next one is uh, the bylaws of its Bowen Island Municipal Land Use Bylaw number 57. 2002, Amendment by Law 562, 2022, which is at uh, 1676 Malpo Creek Road, said 03-2020. And over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Mr. Mayor and Council. And it'll be my first time doing this remotely, so we'll see how this how this goes. But do you see my presentation up on the screen for the um, rezoning? Yeah, it's good. Okay, great. So as the mayor said, we're here to talk about a rezoning application at 1676 Malkin Creek Road. Um, so it's located on the west side of Bowen Island off of Malkin Creek Road, which comes off of Windjam or just past Bowen Bay. Um, and the property is zoned in the area one of CD18. Um, and so crucially for this application, it does not permit the accessory residential use, which is how we regulate um, secondary suites, either attached or detached. Um, and the application is to add that as an accessory use. Um, I've just listed here, there are um, density provisions on the property, including the maximum lot coverage of 25% and a maximum floor area for all buildings of excluding garages of 260 square meters. Um, so this last came to council, the January 25th council meeting and council gave first reading to amendment bylaw 562 to enact the changes. Um, and council referred the bylaw to the advisory planning commission, the environment climate action advisory committee, the parks and trails greenways advisory committee, housing advisory committee, the Vancouver coastal health and the islands trust and to a public information meeting. So I'm here tonight to bring you results of those referrals and consideration of second reading of the bylaw. Um, so the islands trust met March 8th, 2022 um, and the executive executive committee resolved that the amendment bylaw is not contrary to or at variance with the Islands Trust policy statement. Um, Vancouver Coastal Health reviewed the application and the, the um, reports that went with it, and they were satisfied that the proposed septic system and covenants in the subdivision, um, as proposed, could serve an additional secondary dwelling on the property. Um, Coastal Health did provide comment that doesn't relate necessarily to this rezoning application, but just I've noted here and in the report that um, Coastal Health is noting that when homeowners on um, a private water supply system, such as a well, are serving more than a single family residence, that it may be considered a water system under the Drinking Water Protection Act. Um, so this would apply to people building a detached secondary suite served by a well on a property, as well as an attached secondary suite within a house may fall under that same regulation. Um, so not relevant for this rezoning, but just something to, to note in other cases. Um, the Advisory Planning Commission considered this application and um, adopted the motion they support the amendment bylaw. The Environment Climate Action Committee um, provided the comment that they support the proposed conditions and the public process um, and some recommendations about sediment erosion control soil and soil st stability. The Housing Advisory Committee supported um, the motion and they had recommendations about changes to the maximum floor area that I'll discuss later and the lot coverage as well. Um, and the Parks, Trails, Greenways Advisory Committee recommended that as there's now, it's now affecting the proposed rezoning affecting four lots instead of 38, that some of their, their concerns about impacts have been reduced. Um, and they appreciated the proposed trail and park as part of the subdivision of the property. 
Um, and so with that basis, they supported the proposed amendment bylaw. Um, and then March 10th, the applicant and BIM staff hosted a virtual open house. Um, so approximately 10 people attended, primarily the immediate neighbors of it. And questions at that open house centered around the proposed park dedication and trail statutory right of way, building and septic locations on the proposed, proposed lots. And then a lot of discussion about access along Amelia Lane in the shared driveway to access some of the lots. Um, and then finally, some of the participants questioned the maximum floor area area of 260 square meters it's in the zoning, that the amount of floor area may be too small to result in suites being built. Um, and then leading up to and following the open house, staff received seven letters from neighbors of the rezoning who support the proposed amendment bylaw. Um, staff have also heard from two neighbors um, who haven't provided letters, but just spoke to staff verbally. Um, neighbors who use that sh same shared driveway accessing Malcolm Creek Road. Um, and both of them opposed any increased use utilizing the shared driveway. So both of the neighbors said they weren't opposed to the um, proposed rezoning and the increased use, but they had concerns about any proposed, any increase on the, the current access of that driveway. Um, so in terms of overall staff discussion that's in the report, I had a section talking about um, lot coverage and floor area. So this is, if, I don't know how easy it is to see from where you are, but this is the proposed subdivision of the property. So into the 10 acre lot being divided into four properties with a park dedication. Um, and so what it results in is it's lots that are quite a bit larger than are in the rest of the Arbutus Ridge development. So the, the remainder of the Arbutus Ridge development has been developed with quite small lots and quite constrained sites. Um, and in those contexts, the maximum lot coverage makes sense of 25%. But what it means on these, these lots is actually quite a large area that could be covered with buildings or structures. So on the larger lot, um, the zoning just allows 25% lot coverage and ends up being is here at something that's like over 50,000 square feet of lot coverage that's potential on the, the largest lot. Um, and so staff instead are considering and have put in the proposed bylaw changing it to an SR2 level zone, which is 10% of lot coverage plus 100 square meters to a maximum of 500 square meters, um, which would reduce the amount of lot coverage that's potential on those four lots. Um, but in the the flip of it is then the staff would recommend actually an increase the floor area. So the existing house on the property already exceeds the allowable floor area. So in that lot that's provided. Um, and then staff would share the concerns of the housing advisory committee and some of the people in the open house that concerns about with the floor area as it, as it currently is that um, it may not result in, in secondary suites being built at all. So staff have proposed um, in the amendment bylaw to leave the, the outright floor area unchanged, but include a provision where if, if a secondary suite is built in a property, there's a, an increase of 40 square meters um, as a way to sort of help incentivize the provision of rental housing in this development. Um, and so staff sort of proposed those two together, a, a decrease in the lot coverage and an increase in the floor area to result in less of the site being allowed to be developed, but that slightly more um, development allowed for um, provision of, of secondary suites. Um, and then finally, in terms of access to it, so 1676 Malkin Creek Road has an access from Amelia Lane by way of a shared driveway that crosses two other properties before it reaches the property. Um, and then there's also a driveway directly from Malkin Creek Road. So at the time of the Arbutus Ridge rezoning, the proposed access to the some of the additional lots would come through the Arbutus Ridge development itself um, up the current Joan Audrey Lane. However, development plans have changed over time and the current subdivision that is um, has an approved layout um, and is nearing completion would use the shared driveway to access three of the lots on the property. Um, the fire department reviewed the proposed access as part of the initial subdivision application and then again as part of the rezoning application and, and did not find concerns with the route. Um, but nevertheless, two of the property owners who, who share that same route do have, have concerns about increased use along the driveway. Um, so then the staff recommendation would be that council grant second reading to the amendment bylaw as amended and that council refer bylaw 562 to a public hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel. All right, questions, anybody? Sure. Um, I have one and maybe you can 
uh, get this quickly. I mean, generally, I haven't supported. I like the idea, um, uh, but I'm wondering about um, 100 square meters plus 10 percent of lot area, total 50 square meters. I have written down. And is, is that? Oh, that's just my spelling. 500 square meters. Okay, and is that yes? And is that the same as? Um, the 290 that I just saw flash by in your slides, and 50 plus 40. 240 plus 50, I think it was. Or is it is the, that the same? Or is it the other way around? So, Sue Ellen, the first number, the 10% plus 100 square meters, is the lot coverage. Oh, thank you. Never mind. I've got those two mixed up. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, who are the two other owners that have concern about the building <coughs> at, at the of building? Are they Bowen residents? Do they work and live on Bowen? Yeah, we're actually not taking questions from the uh, oh. audience right now. I'm sorry. There is opportunity for questions at the end. Yes. Um, Daniel, I'm, I'm pleased to see that you were able to incorporate the suggestion from the Housing Advisory Committee um, for the uh, 40 additional. And um, just a flashback for the rest of council, it's, that was viewed by um, the Advisory Committee as one way to incentivize the building of secondary suites that would be um, more uh, comfortable, maybe for uh, a family. Yep. Or, uh, couple of people as opposed to you know, a, a smaller one. So it was, it, it was good to see that being incorporated in. Thank you. Great idea. Uh, anybody else have any comments? I just have an infatuated state comment. I, you know, reading it, I had a little trouble figuring out what's well, you know, numbers and so on. But when I finally read the bylaw and saw what you've done, I, I liked what you did. Thanks. Uh, just dangling. A bit of a larger question around development and spread of development on the island and our goals as well. I mean, rental housing is a big one. Another big goal is not to have sprawl happen all over the island <laughs> and being able to service our residents as well. So not having a lot of residents on the other end of the island where everybody has to drive in and out. Um, that's my concern on the impact. Is that a valid concern or can you just your comment on that? I mean, I think the one question in terms of sort of sprawl and, and entry new areas of development, to some extent, you know, this, this property was rezoned as part of the Abutus Ridge rezoning, and the subdivision is taking place under that zoning to create four lots um, that, you know, with or without this application will be rezoned to create, or will be subdivided, sorry, to create those four lots, it could build four houses. <laughs> Um, so the, the effect of this rezoning would be to allow, I mean, additional sort of suites within those houses or, or detached things to be built, but in, in, in a sense, in, in areas that are already, development will already take place. Um, so I have trouble seeing that sort of as like sprawled development versus, okay, it's, it's allowing greater households to be housed in, in areas that are already experiencing development. Um, you know, I think it is a bigger question that's sort of a ongoing growth of Bowen in terms of like where where do people see development taking place? And I think it's really a bigger conversation than than these four potential secondary suites. Uh, okay, Rob. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so and then over. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I was thinking about the same thing too, uh, Councillor Wyman. But uh, to me, the decrease in the lot coverage. And I was looking at the numbers, and that's why. <laughs> I tripped over the other number. Um, the decrease in the lot coverage makes up for that because it means there's fewer garages and workshops and studios and mm. chicken coops, and whatever else, uh, possibly because uh, um, and more of the development impact will go into homes. And uh, so, or and I like the incentivizing part too, but just in general the. Um, this change, as I understand it, comes with a decrease in lot coverage. Correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, I um, I think that's good because you need the functioning ecosystem. And if it's going to be 
changes sooner it built to homes. Okay, uh, Allison first, David. Um, well, I think this hopefully will incentivize more people building a detached suite or rental suite and, um, or, you know, accommodations for other aging members of their families or things like that. And this particular property, I mean, it's on the bus route. The bus goes up in Denver and it's easy to walk down and get on the bus. There's a west side playscape being developed and it's accessible for this area, a nice beach area. So and, um, getting into the cove to make use of shopping, they will be and if the um, specialty area gets going, there'll be a little bit of a market garden and probably a bit of a convenience store, <coughs> store there. So, um, and we do have density donating areas in the OCP dedicated. I don't think all this is one of them. So, yeah, you know, so they could already build a house there. This is just, um, I think, they can, you know, not everybody wants to live in the cove. Everybody can live in the code now. David? Thank you, Gary. Uh, Daniel, sorry for a second question, but I'm wondering about uh, thinking about a little bit the driveway issue. So, is that, you know, some want to use it, some don't want people to use it. Is that anything to do with us or how do we need to be part of that resolution? I have some familiarity with the situation, so I live nearby. Just wondering about it. Um. Yeah, it's one that, so for the subdivision, it's like there's an existing easement um, over two properties to reach reach this property. Um, and in terms of using that then for a subdivision, it's a it's a thing in the, I think the Land Title Act that essentially it's like once you've given an easement over your property, you can't, you know, the subdivision of the sort of the downstream property can then occur without further approvals needed. I mean, it is something for, for council to consider if council was very concerned about increased access over that driveway, you know, you could not proceed with the rezoning until you see change happen or, or want them to, you know, more strenuously seek alternate access and, and not all, be it as a condition of the rezoning that, that they not use that driveway as an access point. Um, I don't know, you know, the, the owners have had conversations with, with our Buse Ridge about access and, and to date haven't, haven't, you know, managed to secure access from that route. Um, so absent that access, I'm not sure what's what's feasible. Um, but it is something if council was concerned about it, you could not proceed with the rezoning until you see an alternate solution. Can I just have some clarifying question to that? So there's four lots being created, but there's all but one of those one of the lots that's being created is going to take an existing house that's already there. So that Correct. driveway is already being used to access a house. And if it's where, <clears throat> I haven't been out there recently, but if it's where I think it is, it's not your typical driveway. It's, uh, you know, it's relatively, you know, decent road. You know, I call it more of a little road. I don't know that it's much narrower than what goes up into our beautiful to um, Evergreen. So mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. So I, I don't I don't think it's a big issue other than they don't want, I guess, three more households driving by there. Well, not, not necessarily going to be three more either. But. Well, there's four lots being created. So yeah. it'll be three plus three more. Yeah, four more with the cash. Three more, yeah. So, but it's not a lot of more traffic. It may not be any. Like, I think given the clarity of Daniel's presentation and it's going to a public hearing, I'd well be happy to read this. Absolutely. That bylaw number 562 2022 cited as Bowen Island Municipality Land Use Bylaw number 57 2002 Amendment Bylaw 562 2022 to be read a second time as amended and that council refer bylaw number 562, 2022, to a public hearing. All right, thank you. I'll second. Okay, I got David on second that. Any further discussion? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Daniel, I just want to confirm that this has no impact um, on the uh, requirement that the secondary suites not be uh, used for short-term rental purposes. 
Sorry, I said that as a negative. <laughs> These suites cannot be used for short-term rental given the CD zoning. Is that correct? Correct. This zone doesn't permit residential guest accommodation or home occupation. So the, the properties aren't permitted short-term rental or bed and breakfast use. Right. So they would only be used for long-term residential purposes. Yeah, or they could be, you know, constructed and used for, for visiting yeah. family or but not as a not as a business. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further discussion? No, no, that's a question all in favor. All right. Opposed? Yeah. Oh, okay. Sort of winding the opposition. And uh, okay, so we're gonna move on to the uh, we're gonna move to the committee of the whole, I guess this one here. Make sure we're at the right spot here. And we will, the recommendation is council move to committee of the whole, discuss the proposed site alteration bylaw, and we will move that to recommendation by consensus and move into 8.2, which is proposed site alteration bylaw. Back over to you, Deputy Martin. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just have a short, well, short ish presentation to go through. Um, do you see that one okay? Yes. Great. Uh, right. So here to discuss the proposed um, site alteration bylaw. So I just start with some, some background information. So looking at our official community plan, there's a policy that talks about um, removal or deposit of soil from a parcel may be subject to regulation by bylaw. So that's um, what is before you today is a, a site alteration bylaw. And there's a couple more listed in the report as well, but um, just wanted to highlight that. And objective 22, which is about maintaining high water quality, stability, and quality of so soils. Um, so again, what a, a site alteration bylaw tries to do. And um, in our Island Plan 2021, looked at um, continuing work on a site alteration bylaw. So um, right at the bottom there, the site alteration bylaw to um, implement and fund the work plan, engage the public, and present draft bylaws and recommendations to council. So. Um, we're no longer in 2021, but we're up to this point C in that um, strategic priority. And then in terms of other backgrounds, so at the March 14th meeting, council ratified direction from an earlier committee of the whole to direct staff to draft a site alteration bylaw to bring to a committee of the whole meeting before the end of April, which is where we are today, um, and to prepare engagement material associated with the site alteration bylaw for a public engagement session. Um, so the proposed bylaw that's before you would establish different levels of permitting required for site alteration with escalating permit fees and application requirements based on the extent of site alteration proposed. Um, and so the bylaw itself would, base, would be based on a definition of site alteration, which would mean um, any of the following or combination of the following, the placing, dumping, or deposit of soil or other materials on land, the alteration of the grade of the land by any means, including placing soil, clearing, blasting, and grubbing, and the compaction of soil or the creation of impervious surfaces. Um, and then it would include a definition for exposed soil, which would meet an area of a lot where the vegetation has been removed and to see an increased risk of erosion and del deleterious effects from movement of, movement of sediment. Um, so then the, the bylaw itself, as I go through it, I just have done in the presentation sort of this idea of th there are these different levels within the bylaw of what kind of permitting is required. So some things would be exempt, some things would have minimal permitting requirements, and other things would need um, more extensive plans. So um, activities that are exempt, and so there's obviously no fee required and no permit required. Removal of less than 10 cubic meters of soil or of less than 20 cubic meters of soil on somewhere that is um, has an average slope of less than 20% or the creation of less than 50 square meters of exposed soil. And so I've just tried to pull images, trying to measure, give some sense to people of what um, what 50 square meters is. So in this case, it's like half of one side of a tennis court is about 50 square meters in terms of how large an area that is. Um, the next permit would have a $50 fee and this would be removal of soil less than 50 cubic meters or the creation of less than 100 square meters of exposed soil. Um, so this would be about half a tennis court then is, is that 100 square meters. And we would require basic um, title information, a sort of basic description of work, and then would retain the ability to ask for more information if required, if, if that's not sufficient for us to, to issue a permit. Um, the next level would be between that 50 and 100 
cubic meters of soil in a calendar year or between 100 and 250 square meters of exposed soil, there'd be a $250 fee and a $1,000 deposit for that size of work. Um, and so measuring it's about the, the cycle track it picks, it's about that 250 square meters of, of soil exposed. So that's just, when we say exposed soil, again, it's the removal of, of vegetation and sort of clearing of the site. Um, so in those cases, looking for a site plan, location of the soil, if you're removing the soil and depositing it somewhere, it's listing that um, description, the amount of soil removed, and then looking for a plan from a rich professional for, to oversee the work. Um, a medium amount, so it's between 100 and 1,000 cubic meters of soil, or 250 to 1,000 square meters of exposed soil. So in this case, this would be like the, around the size of the whole tennis court area at Bix, it would be 650 square meters. Um, and so the permit requirements for that would be as before, but include plans for drainage and erosion control, both during work and after completion, and then a proposed grading and rehabilitation plan for the site. So showing what the grades will be after you're done the work. Um, and then I just want to highlight to the, the plans for um, erosion drainage control, both during work and after completion is a big one. So we've seen recently developments where they will have a civil plan and they'll show that they've thought about, you know, stormwater and, and drainage control after completion of the site. Um, but often during construction will, is sort of a challenge that hasn't been fully considered. So the, the plan will be, well, when we've built the, the retention ponds and the swales that it will manage the runoff, but, but not always fully thought out is, is what happens to the drainage, you know, during construction before that takes place. So highlighting that is a, a thing that we would be looking for. Um, and then finally, a large, a large amount would be a thousand dollar fee and a five thousand dollar deposit, and this would be removing more than a thousand cubic meters of soil or more than a thousand square meters of exposed soil. So, um, in this case, the, the Bix turf field is about fifteen hundred square meters in area, um, or the community center has removed nineteen hundred cubic meters of material. So, would be examples of what a, a large permit would be. Um, the permit requirements being the same as for the medium permit, but but just larger fee amounts and deposit amounts. Um, and then, so in terms of, of public engagement, what staff are proposing is to do an in-person and a virtual open house and seek referral to the Environment Climate Action Advisory Committee. Um, staff have listed here sort of for, for council discussion, um, including the online paper surveys similar to them with the hazardous development permit area. Um, and then as well, the potential to actually mail out notice to, to properties on Bowen and do a direct mail out um, of the proposed bylaw to seek further comment. Um, and then so should this project proceed, staff would see engagement taking place in May and then returning to council in June with a bylaw um, for consideration of a reading. Um, and then that's the staff recommendation, but I think I'll stop now and, and open up for discussion. Some questions there, David. That's Gary, and thank you, Daniel. I, I really like what you've done. I like the way you structured it so that it becomes, um, you know, more difficult or more um, a more serious situation as, as there, there's more impact and you end up getting into the mitigation and so on. That's great. But my question is just simply where did the where did you get the numbers from? I mean 20 cubic meters of long soil and that you don't need to do anything for that. Um, is, is that from other bylaws or I'm just wondering I'm not saying anything for or against the numbers mm -hmm. and where they came from that's all. Yeah so I mean one is review of other bylaws. We did some staff um, referrals internally trying to determine what an appropriate number is and I agree like it's hard trying to come up with okay what's an appropriate threshold what's what, what how are we trying to capture like what level of activity is thought to be captured and so you know th this is fully a, a draft bylaw and open for input and I expect to get input on it through the engagement process that will help guide you know what's in a bylaw that comes for council's consideration but but I think a, a mix of both it's like review of what other places except seem to be somewhere in that, somewhere between 10 and 30 is typically a cutoff of what, what needs a, a permit. Yeah, okay, good. Thanks, Danny. That's my question. Yeah. So. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'll take this off while I speak so I can be heard <coughs> clearly. Um, I, uh, I really like the dis description showing the examples from the tennis court. Thank you very much, because that answered some of my questions right there such as what if people need want a big vegetable garden? Well, that fits into the first category pretty much. 
Um, my second, uh, my other question is, um, uh, I saw that land in the agricultural land reserve that's gonna be used for farming would be exempt, is what I understood. Um, what about uh, lands that are designated for agricultural use in our official community plan, but are not agricultural land reserve lands? Um, would they have to submit a permit? Because it looks to me like they would probably be in the, well, it, anyway, may, may, that's my question. Mm. I don't know how many of those agricultural land, agricultural designation lands there are, but I just wondered if you thought about that. It's true, I mean, I think the way I've written this exemption, you'd have to be in the ALR and farmed. And that might be different. I would have to consider, I guess, what our land use bylaw does, because the other option would just be we're exempting farming activity under the you know Right to Farm Act. We're saying it's normal farm use, you're exempt. Yeah. Like that could be reworded. I mean, and in terms of vegetable gardens too, it's something I've thought about even as I've done the presentation after the you know the bylaws been been published. And it's like, oh, should we be exempting vegetable gardenship or fire smart principles or you know, there's sort of other things that we can tweak. I think to the bylaw that we could consider, um, and some of it comes down to you know, like the question of you know what does council want to regulate, what does what does the public want to see regulated, and other sort of general activities. We'd say, well, we don't mean to capture those. Um, so different communities, when you look at their bylaws, exempt different things that clearly have come up in their community to say, okay, well, we want to regulate you know large scale land development, but we don't really want to be regulating, yeah, whatever it may be, somebody building a garden. Okay, hey, thank you. Uh, if you, we'll see what comes back from what you write and what come what comes in public comment, I mm -hmm. guess. And uh, I've got some material from a meeting. I was just part of a implementing a farm plan uh, public input session on Denman, and uh, so I've got some recent info from yeah. consultants there, and I'll send that to you if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. thank you. All right. Uh, anybody else? Allison. Okay, so just, um, I can't really see the screen all that well. So the a, a full-size tennis court is how big? Uh, 650 square meters. 650 square meters. So that one out in Tunstall, or the one down by the mix is 650 square meters. So your 50 square meters of exposed soil and that means they've cut the trees down and removed the vegetation. Mm -hmm. And that's defined somewhere. Yeah. yeah. Okay, I thought it was. Um, I guess part of my question is that could be an awful big area on a small lot, but minuscule on a large flat lot. So um, is, is there any relationship to the size of the lot? There's not right now. It's something I had considered is, do we say it's, you know, is it tied to a percent of lot area or, you know, or an area to, to try to cap, capture that thing of saying, well, if it's a 10 acre lot, it's not that big. You know, so I think that's a question because um, versus it's like, well, no, we're just concerned about the impact of that size of, of clearing, regardless of the size of the property. And so if you cleared it and it was flat and you put planted grass, have you got exposed soil? Mm -hmm. Sorry, Allison, I'm just looking up the definition. So it's, it's areas of a lot where vegetation has been removed causing increased risk of erosion. If you plant it with, with grass like we've done on the hillside yeah. and the way down here to Trunk Road, um, then there's no increased risk of erosion because it's been replanted. So you're you've got that funny sort of area in the middle in the doing of the process. Mm -hmm. Yeah like you you cleared it and immediately replanted. Yeah. Right? Are you clearing the vegetation? I guess we would have had to reply for <laughs> outside over here. Mm -hmm. Well, I would think regardless, that would be have been like site alteration of a scale that would need have needed a permit. 
So thank you. And the square meters, <coughs> 10 square meters is what? Not two by two by two, because that's eight. So a little bit more than, than seven feet by seven. Uh, 10 square meters is quite a bit. I'm trying, I still think in feet, I'm too old. So about the size, it's about the size of this pit here would be about 10 square meters. Yeah, probably. I'm not talking about square meters, I'm talking about cubic meters. Oh, well, cubic meters. I'm just saying this in here, this area here is. So we visualize a yard at six. A yard's three. Well, this is a six foot table. Yeah. So a yard, so a yard, yard is slightly ground. smaller than a cubic meter. Yeah, so that's two cubic, two cubic yards there. So it's not that much, I guess. Is what no. I'm yeah. yeah. Okay. So. Oh, thank you. I just wanted to, now that my question's been answered, I'm, um, I just want to say I'm really in favor of this uh, bylaw, and uh, I have seen um, construction sites with uh, mud coming off of them thicker than chocolate milk for, for weeks, and, and uh, so I'm glad that you're thinking about the um, uh, during construction side of it as well as the uh, uh, bits from the official community plan about um, uh, quality of the water and the quality of soils and stability and all those things are wonderful and I'd li like to move the motion. So I'm going to move um, that the committee of the whole recommend council direct staff to refer the proposed site alteration bylaw to a public open house and to the Environment and Climate Action Advisory Committee. Okay, thank you, Sue. One second, I got David over there. Uh, just, just a comment here. Um, I think this will go a long way to stop some of the devastation we've seen on Bowen Island. It was absolutely shocking. What is there in place here? And I read through the whole thing and I just thought about it now. But if you're willing to pay the amount that it's going to cost, um, is, is there a limit to how much you can clear there's not a limit. So a site alteration bylaw would be to, to regulate it, to say, okay, you need a plan for showing how you're going to do it in a safe manner. And, you know, you've thought about where it's deposited. Um, but in and of itself, it's not a mechanism to say you can't, um, you know, you couldn't clear a site. If, if you've met other bylaws, it wouldn't prohibit it. It would regulate the activity. So if you've got, if you've got lots of money, you can do whatever you want. Yeah, Sorry I mean, consistent with with other bylaws, and if you followed, you know, your plans from your engineers, um, it wouldn't prohibit somebody who said, "I want to," you know, flatten the lot. I, I, I want to flatten my lot. It would say, "Okay, you need to show that you're doing it in a safe way, that it's regulated, you're not causing damage to, you know, the environment and and slope stability and whatever else." Um, but it's not it's not like an environmentally sensitive area development permit area, which would so you can't do it in certain areas. Okay, uh, Liam? And I think one of the additional factors is um, currently the way it stands is that a uh, property owner can go in and clear the site and develop the site prior to even having uh, an excavation permit or having a building permit. And so this is to get ahead of that to ensure that they've got that proper planning in place and that those types of considerations during construction are in place. Because we, we tend to see that where the uh, property owner like, clears the lot, yeah. Clears the lot, prepare, preps the site, and then comes forward. And, and at that point, we then say, okay, well, you need these types of permits, but they've already done all that. The damage has been done. So, well, that's good, but there doesn't seem to be anything in place here that limits what you can do on that piece of property. No, that's not the intention. Oh, so we're still going to end up with devastation. Not necessarily. Well, not necessarily, of course not, but we still, this isn't stopping that. This is to help improve the construction process and the site alteration process so that um, that site alteration can still occur, but it, now it'll be regulated. Better regulated. Yeah. But you're not regulated because you're not stopping. We're not stopping. No. There's no regulation on that. No, we really haven't, haven't solved my problem. Yeah. <laughs> Allison, and then over. Um, I'm under yeah. section 17 of the bylaw, and I'm sorry if I missed it in the report. 
it looks like we're not levying fines or 17.1 and 17.2 are contradictory to one another. I mean, if you go ahead and do the, the two that, you know, the things that require permits, there doesn't seem to be a fine for it. We got to go and do the summary conviction and all that sort of stuff. So Allison, when I bring the bylaw, I'll bring a bylaw enforcement notice amendment bylaw um, that will go with it, that will impose penalties. Um, I hadn't brought it with the draft bylaw for that discussion, but that's something we would do in concert, same with when we've adopted other bylaws. Penalties are fine, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. So, so then 17.2 doesn't sort of make sense because it says um, something about um, uh, liable under convi upon conviction to the penalties prescribed under the Offense Act. So, Typically, our bylaws have both provisions, so it's that we can we can find through the bylaw notice, or um, and and or we could seek um, repeat offenders get them. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Daniel, my comments. Us, we're introducing here, and I think most people will be able to understand the good reasons behind. But we are introducing here a new level of permitting. Am I correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we're introducing this new level of permit, which I presume you will have you and <coughs> your colleagues in planning will have to administer. I mean, I guess ultimately it'd be a decision for the the CAO, but but most likely. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'm, I guess I'm just asking the question. Here we are with a brand new level of administration. I, I just hope this isn't going to create a already busy people yet more work and in the process create administrative bottlenecks. So I, I hope, please, that when you bring this forward, uh, okay, another layer of administration, another layer of permitting, for good reasons. I've never heard of a bad reason yet. And uh, I just hope, I just hope that it's not gonna create an administrative uh, mess and, and, and defeat the good intentions. So please, will you be able to demonstrate to us how this is going to actually work? Yeah, and I think some of that is getting sort of the thresholds right and trying to identify, okay, these are activities we want to regulate. Um, because some of it, you know, makes sense. Some of it goes, okay, at a, at a subdivision stage, you would get a site alteration permit. And in theory, that would govern sort of the site development of the whole subdivision. Um, and if done correctly, then it could go up to the point where you're then selling people, you know, prepped lots where they're just building it and um, it exempts building permits. So then the individual lot purchasers wouldn't need to, to then get a, another permit. They would just build on the, the prepared development site and they could get a building permit and, and go their way. Um, so that seems like that's a clear path that would happen. It's like at development at subdivision stage, there's already a number of you know requirements and this would just be one more to say, okay, we've ensured it's all taken place. Um, you have a plan for the, the development work you're doing at subdivision stage. Where it gets trickier is sort of the individual properties that already exist and, and what level of activity of people, you know, working on their own property do we want to regulate? Um, yeah. Well, just so long as uh, please lay it out for us. <laughs> You know, we don't want to make massive amount of extra work for no good purpose. Anybody else? Okay, I'll ask a question all in favor. Right. We got Great, thank you. And thank you, Daniel, for that one. And we're going to move on to 8.3, which is the 2022 to 2026 five year financial plan, results of public engagement. Watson, Chief Financial Officer. Kristen, over you. Thank you. Thank you, Miranda. I'll start with a few minutes just to kind of talk about the process to date. Um, the 2022 to 2026 budget process has been completed under a very compressed time frame. Um, the budget development did start only during March. We did have separate meetings with each of the water and sewer committee member uh, LACs. They took place during the last week of March. Um, 
typically and in future, we definitely would like to see this budget development process conclude by the end of January. And I'm quite certain the CAO would like to see it conclude earlier than that even, but um, we'll, we'll uh, definitely be targeting for a much earlier wrap up to this process next year. Um, we held a committee of the poll on April 11th where managers and myself presented to council. Um, we, uh, the, council, the council received a presentation from the interim library director of the library board's budget back in October. The budget material was made available in the Citizen Lab platform for public feedback for the uh, period of 11, April 11th to the 24th. On April 21st, um, a, a, an in-person and a hybrid Zoom budget open house meeting was held. Uh, we had two people arrive and show up in person and um, several others attend uh, by, by Zoom. All of the staff presentations have been made available online and they can be watched on the BIM YouTube channel. And the public may continue to submit additional comments and feedback directly to council at the mayor and council email address at bimbc.ca. Um, just to kind of refresh some of the underlying assumptions, the assessed value on Bowen Island increased by $692 million this year. That was an average increase of just over 24%. For 2022, the proposed property tax increase included in the five-year plan is 10.42%. And for 2023, the proposed property tax increase is 10.7%. And the impact to an average taxpayer um, with, a, with an increase of 10.42%, uh, based on an average um, home value of just over 1.5 million, last year the average home value was uh, just over 1.2 million, um, the average impact to uh, an average property owner would be approximately $287 on the municipal Every year, council is required, it is a requirement of the community charter, that council considers the distribution of the property tax levy among the different property tax classes. So these distributions have been established to kind of recognize the proportional demands upon municipal infrastructure and services that the different property classifications bring. Um, under the status quo, uh, council has established a one-to-one -one ratio for business properties that are classified as business. And that means that the proposed property tax collection would be distributed among the residential and the farm and the recreation, all of the different categories um, like this. If for illustrative purposes, council wanted to um, change that property tax collection distribution ratio. And for illustrative purposes, I've used 1.5 times here as a, um, uh, for, for example, so for every dollar collected from residential under a, a, a different property tax distribution ratio, council could charge businesses 1.5 times. That would um, increase the property tax levy by about $58,000 to be collected from the business property tax um, owners. So this is, it's something that I'm bringing up it's a, a requirement of the community charter that council consider that distribution ratio year after year. It's, it was established in 1999, it's never been changed. And, um, and it is just kind of a formal housekeeping piece process within the uh, financial plan development process that we as staff need to ensure that, that council um, either affirms or directs staff to change that. Uh, that collection ratio. Every year as part of the financial plan development process, the library board uh, sets out a request for an annual operating budget. So the library does receive its own source revenues. They have provincial grants and they um, charge some incidental fees and, and late fines and things like that. 
They have about, about $40,000 of revenue each year, and the balance comes from the Bowen Island Municipality contribution. So over the um, 10 or so years, uh, the library board has averaged um, an increase of about 7.7% each year. And this is right in line actually with the average Bowen Island municipal tax increase um, that's coming in at about 7.6%. I only went back to 2017 for the Bowen Island um, collection. And I did that because in 2016, the structure that how we collected property taxes changed and council uh, got rid of the parks parcel tax. So there was a big portion of the annual funding that was collected through a parks parcel tax on everybody. And after 2016, that, that um, it really provided a big increase to the annual property tax levy, but that parcel tax was gone. So it, it kind of um, skewed the data a little bit. So I just used from 2017 for that graph. So in October, uh, as I indicated before, council was provided with the information from the interim library director about the budget request for the library board. So this year, the library board has requested uh, a total property budget of about 364,000, and that's um, about an increase of approximately 6.3% over last year. So another piece of that whole financial plan development process is that council needs to um, consider the request from the library board and they, um, they will direct staff to either approve that budget or um, adjust the budget. Um, it, it's just that money then becomes part of the financial plan and um, is used to pay the operating expenditures and the annual book purchases and, and furniture and fixtures, that kind of thing. Um, for the library. Uh, Tourism Bowen Island, they have put in a request this year for um, $48,000. And uh, in developing the financial plan, I actually uh, only put in the $20,000, which is the same amount of contribution that they've been provided with for several years. And in making that decision to put it in or leave it out, I kind of considered the other ways in which council does provide support to businesses. Um, for example, there's the one-to-one -one property tax ratio, and there's also through the work of the Economic Development Committee that um, the request for a 140% increase to the budget was a significantly large enough request that I felt that that should be left to council consideration. Some of the things that are driving the cost in the budget this year, uh, this slide I brought forth from one of my earlier presentations. About 15% of the property tax increase is used to pay um, increased debt servicing charges over the previous year. Now this amount is not discretionary and there's, uh, there is no potential for any kinds of cost savings here. About 25% of the property tax increase is attributable to the contributions required to support our capital project expenditures. The total contribution to reserve funds in 2021 was just over $1.7 million. And in 2022, the total contribution to reserve funds is uh, just over 1.9 million. So that's about a $200,000 increase year over year. And in the five-year financial plan, there are two contributions that are being set aside as a contingency for community center construction. So $500,000 in each of 2022 and 2023. And that's because the funding plan for the community center is not yet confirmed. There is a $2.5 million budget shortfall, and that is being addressed through additional fundraising, and a new grant application for a Canadian Cultural Spaces grant. And um, the, the budget is planned to be funded through these alternative methods of fundraising. But just the same, um, I think it's prudent 
and financially sound strategy to ensure that there is some additional fund rate, uh, funds available to council in the event that either of those uh, those funding sources don't pan out as planned. As well, the financial plan includes dedicated contributions to the reserve funds, which will replenish the balances in the reserve funds over the five-year period. So once the community center construction is complete, the municipality could resume regular dedicated contributions to the reserve funds, and that will replenish the balances over the remainder of the five-year period. So I wanted to take a few minutes just to talk about some of the capital projects that are included in the budget. And some of the feedback that I um, have read uh, indicated perhaps that some of these capital projects should be put off or uh, deferred or that there's a lot of front-ended loading in the first uh, year and second year of the budget. So many of them are already underway and, and they have to be completed in that time frame. So the community center obviously has started and is expected to complete by July of 2023. The fire hall is uh, well on its way to being complete. The multi-use path, uh, the work from Cardina Road up to the uh, school is well underway. And the fire truck uh, replacement, that was a piece of equipment that was, it's a very long lead time. It was actually ordered in 2020 and we do expect to be taking delivery of that in um, the next couple of months. There are some smaller maintenance and equipment replacement types of capital expenditures included in the budget. So these are really regular ongoing uh, replacements of uh, equipment or, or maintenance in trails and, and parks and things like that. There is a big capital project uh, that we've identified called the Trunk Road Stormwater Management Rehabilitation Project. And this is an emerging issue. The funding for this project is coming about a third from grant revenue that we receive from uh, TransLink. And about two thirds of it, the remaining two thirds of it is going to be coming from our reserves. This project uh, must proceed. It has, um, it, it's impacting the safety of Trunk Road and the Trunk Road itself, as well as the sidewalks. There are capital projects that could potentially be deferred or reduced in scope. That includes the, um, the roads and the culverts rehabilitation projects and the, um, the on-island composting. The impact of deferring our roads capital projects is significant because reduction or, or downsizing the scope of these projects, we're just really pushing the problem down the road. And, and the costs of remediating those problems at that time become much more expensive and the conditions worsen even more and then require even more work and more money to fix. The on-island composting project, however, is one that hasn't started yet. It's uh, proposed to be a $1.5 million con uh, project and it will be funded one third by a municipal contribution and two thirds by a grant. And this project is required that it be started uh, by October. But um, in conversation with, with uh, the CAO, we do believe perhaps that it would be worthwhile to reach out to the province to see if there's any um, willingness to extend that grant and perhaps push that off into the next fiscal year. And that would be able to preserve and, and uh, preserve staff time and staff resources to really focus on the ongoing uh, capital projects that we um, aren't able to, to defer at this time. As well, we don't actually have the money for our municipal contribution. We're gonna to have to borrow for it. So if we are able to defer it, that would allow us the time to see how the fundraising campaign goes for um, for community center and perhaps take one of those $500,000 contributions that we're setting aside. Perhaps that could be repurposed to fund the municipal contribution for the Composting. So there's all kinds of good reasons to actually see if there's any willingness to defer this project. Um, other potential for savings, 60% um, of the property tax increase is, is, being, is being driven by the rising operating costs. So any reductions to operating costs um, possibly could result in a, in a decrease to the property tax levy. Some of our 
um, operating expenses are discretionary. We've got um, money that we plan on using for professional development and training or communications or maintenance budgets or grants to the community. Then we also have a category of operating expenses that are um, not discretionary at all. And those include things like our collective agreement provisions, um, our insurance premiums, and um, of course rent here at the municipal hall and, and fuel costs for um, equipment and vehicle operations. Certain of these expenses um, are non-discretionary or they're also, um, several of them are often committed by contract, so they're unavoidable. Uh, talk a little bit about the process that we went through and the um, what happened, what transpired at the meetings with the local area service committees. So um, staff met with each of the local area service committees during the last week of March or the first week of April. And we received a recommendation from all eight committees to council to include um, their five-year financial plans as part of the municipal budget. In Tunstall Bay, there's a new reservoir project this year, and uh, Tunstall Bay residents will be looking at having a new parcel tax this year, $853 for connected properties and $512 for unconnected properties. The rates are going to be um, increased by 20% over the next um, year, and that's needed to fund a significant capital project that's happening to a pressure reducing valve chamber upgrade in Tunstall Bay. Um, there was direction or a request to council to direct staff to investigate if a new borrowing could be undertaken that would end up lengthening the term of that amortization period. So once we get through our financial plan process, um, we can make some inquiries of the MFA to see if there's any uh, any way that we can um, just lengthen that term to sort of ease the burden of that uh, $853 payment. In Snug Cove Sewer, um, we are planning, or we are undertaking a significant upgrade to the wastewater treatment plant. It is um, coming at a cost of $1.6 million. The plan includes the use of $1 million to be funded from the capital renewal and replacement reserve and $640,000 of accumulated surplus. And part of that cost will be repaid by the Snow Cove sewer users to accumulate operating surplus over the next seven years. So $718,000 is going to be repaid by the Snow Cove sewer users themselves. This money is going to be collected by additional user fees and um, a new parcel tax only on those properties connected to the sewer. Parcel taxes are levied to property owners who live in the sewer area and not outside. In Eagle Cliff, we met with the LAC. They approved a recommendation to increase their annual revenue requirement from 66,000 to 80,000 per year. Uh, we proposed a new rate structure to, um, to achieve that additional collection. And the LAC um, asked that they do they work with us to um, to come up with an amended rate structure themselves. So we agreed we will work jointly with the LAC members to develop a new rate structure that is going to be able to achieve those desired revenue targets. And the parcel tax in Eagle Cliff has been increased from 370 per property, connected or not, um, to 400 dollars that's wrong way. Uh, the budget for Eagle Cliff also includes a significant capital project which, um, which contemplates an interconnection between Cold Bay Water and Eagle Cliff. There has been uh, significant grant funding that may be available to support this project and a grant application has been um, submitted to help support this project. Uh, the total cost of this project is about four and a half million dollars with a significant portion, um, about 3.6 coming from grant funding. So uh, we expect those applications to hear back um, in the fall or maybe early next year. And we, we'll just wait and see what happens there. Um, but there is a significant uh, amount of, of 
capital work that's necessary in like to ensure that they have that reliable supply. Cope Bay Water, we met with the LAC and reviewed our five-year um, financial plan. The LAC recommended actually that the increase, that the increase of provision for annual capital maintenance and increase uh, revenue generated for each year of the 2023 to 2026 fiscal year. So there needs to be a new user rate um, in the Cope Bay Water District, and we will review that in the fall with the LAC with a move to shift that to even more of a consumption-based pricing. Westside water systems have traditionally been um, uh, on a harmonized rate structure. And uh, this year we put the exact same rate proposals in front of them. Uh, we have increased the revenue requirements in each of King Edward Bay, Bowen Bay and Blue Water Park for between 10 and 13% each year for each of the five years. Um, that we will uh, work with these three committees at a later date, a little bit later this spring um, to um, explore the suitability of continuing with this harmonized rate structure. Uh, currently it's 960 for connected and 600 for non-connected. Blue Water Park incidentally also has significant capital uh, requirements, but um, uh, we're not there yet with a, a, you know, a plan that's ready to go to be put forth to the LAC. We will need to schedule additional meetings with the Blue Water Park LAC. We'll need to uh, discuss the MOU and consider future options for uh, capital upgrades there. And lastly, in good point, uh, the parcel tax has been increased from 205 to 210 for the unconnected properties and 415 to 420 for the connected properties. And the user rate in Hood Point has been increased annually from 800 to 840. So uh, the impact of our parcel taxes are becoming quite significant. Um, a person living in, uh, owning a property in the Snug Cove Sewer District, which is also completely within the Cove Bay District, will be subject to the new sewer parcel tax, as well as the Cove Bay parcel taxes, one and two, as well as the garbage and recycling. So somebody now living in um, the sewer district is looking at paying um, 1550 per year in parcel taxes. Uh, Cove Bay is um, quite significant now too, just over $800 per year on average in parcel taxes. Tunstall Bay has this new five-year parcel tax. So they're looking at um, paying just over $1,400 per year in parcel taxes. And Hood Point and Eagle Cliff are the two water districts that have always had parcel taxes. And on average, um, they'll be looking at just over a thousand in this point and just over a thousand as well in Eagle. So as part of the development, the budget development, the next step is that council should consider some, um, providing some direction to staff and, and um, make some recommendations to the committee of the whole should make some recommendations to the council to provide clear direction to staff in order to um, um, give us the opportunity to bring back a financial plan bylaw that council feels is supportable and defensible and that you would like to move forward with. So for example, uh, we, uh, council should consider the adoption of an alternative tax collection scheme. So uh, last year, I think, and the year before that, council did adopt a bylaw, which um, um, varied the amount of penalty that was due as of the first late day of um, unpaid property taxes. So the community charter establishes a 10% rate of uh, penalty imposed on late payment of taxes, but council has the opportunity, they may by bylaw, vary that and come up with an alternative tax collection scheme. So um, in past years, council has provided for 5% on the first late day and 5% a month later kind of thing. Um, I am suggesting that in order to encourage prompt and timely payment of taxes this year, that council stick with the, um, with the community charter uh, tax collection penalty that is um, outlined of 10% on the first late day. Um, 
there are some uh, uh, the, uh, the process of considering the distribution of the property taxes between the different assessment classes. So in order to um, ensure that the tax paid by the different property assessment classes accurately reflects the, the demand or the use of municipal services, then council should um, provide direction to staff to, uh, to affirm or, or amend that, uh, that property tax distribution ratio. Did you want me to stop and did you want an opportunity to talk about it or do you want me to just go through them all and then you can Sure. Go them all? Okay. Okay, thanks. Consideration of approval of additional FCP. Um, they have been left out of the budget given the, um, the financial constraints that we're under. I know that there was some very uh, strong cases put forward to um, include additional FTD in this budget this year. And I don't um, want to minimize or detract from the, the, the need. Um, I just think that needs to be balanced against the, the significant financial challenges that we are facing with the uh, capital projects that we are undertaking. Council should consider and provide direction to staff um, with regards to the additional $28,000 funding request from Tourism Bowen Island. Uh, Council should direct staff to include the draft five-year financial plans for each of the seven water systems that has actually been dealt with in the consent agenda. And um, I'll just remember that direction to staff to include the Snug Cove sewer budget in the 2022 to 2026 financial plan was already provided at the regular council meeting held on April 11th. So that um, all of those have been dealt with. <clears throat> um, last, so second to last, council should consider the proposed 10.4 property tax increase, should consider your comfort level with it. And if that is, um, something that you feel you can support and provide direction to staff to include that in the financial plan. And lastly would be consideration of the library board's request for funding for this year of um, $368,504. And that's it. Hmm. All right, well, let's uh... Want to just go through them again from the top and we'll have general discussion on them. See if we can. Yeah, I can do that. So, first, uh, we are asking council for direction on um, adoption of an alternative tax collection bylaw or to maintain that which is provided for in the community charter. Awesome. I think we should. Um, just go back to what's provided for in the community charter. <clears throat> we did the 2020, um, the first time we did that was in 2020, and that was following the province's um, direction and um, was because of COVID, and we renewed that again in 2021 because of COVID. So uh, go back to the normal one. It's simpler, it matches everybody's. Uh, go ahead, Let's see if I can get to your phone directly. Oh, okay, I was just going to say uh, I agree. I think we should go back to the uh, uh, the one that's recommended by the community charter, the regular. Yeah, the regular, one, not the alternative. Yeah. Okay, everything. I just have the recommendation as sure. written in the report, which is that the committee of the whole recommend to council that the municipality not develop an alternative tax question bylaw for 2022. Okay, now, with that yeah. second over there, and all in favor? Okay, let's get you in. Thank you. Do you want me to read the recommendation out loud? Sure. Okay. sure. <clears throat> it's fine. Uh, the second one, as outlined in Kristen's report, is that the Committee of the Whole recommend to Council that the property tax ratios should be maintained, should be amended such that businesses and others pay blank times the residential rate, that industry, like industry pays blank times the residential rate, Recreation and not for profit pay blank times residential rate. You pay blank times residential rate. Farm properties pay blank times residential rate. 
Okay, Kristen, can we have that up on the board, the, what, the original one? Yeah. I had to go all the way back. Oh, there it is. Uh, so the question there it is. easier is, do you want to consider changes to this ratio or do you want to affirm the status quo? Okay, Rob? Yeah, just a couple of comments on that. Uh, it's, I think it surprised me and some other kinds as well surprised that the differences between our municipality and other municipalities. Um, uh, industrial four times as much as residential, business one on one is, is the same. And that was very different than, I think AMO was the only one that had one to one ratio on that. Um, but I will say, I think if we are gonna change that rate structure, we need to do a lot more work on that. I need to understand as a counselor, advantages, disadvantages, what's normal, what's not normal, and definitely some consultation with the local business community as well, so we have their input, which we don't have right now. So, um, so as far as that goes, I think we, uh, I'd be in favor of staying with the rates that we have right now and not changing them until we do that lead work and it makes sense to do so. Um, so that's, that's what's Thanks, Robin Allison. Um, I was just going to say, I think for this year, we definitely need to stay with okay. what we've got. Anybody else? Mike? Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm certainly I actually feel very, very strongly indeed that the property tax ratio should be maintained. Two major reasons for saying it. You cannot change someone's property ratios, probably within a significant part of their financial year, without giving much due notice and without considerable consultation. Also, in the terms of the business cycle, we are probably heading into a very one, two, three years, a very difficult uh, business trading. And it's not just levels, it's, just, it's the availability of staff and housing and the supply chains. So I can think of nothing more catastrophic. Business, and many of them are small businesses here on the island, need certainty. So I'd like to make clear, I hope today we'll make it clear to everybody with a business out there that they are not to look forward to uh, a change in our, in our normal one-to-one -one ratios, which it should be left as standing. Okay, so um, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, uh, I think, uh, like Councilor Lyon, that we should examine uh, the possibilities of, uh, should businesses and residences be paying the same tax rates um, but hearing the other councillors, I think that should be left to it another year. We need to know more data and consult. And uh, so I'd be happy to move the motion that sure. the committee of the whole recommend to council that property tax ratios should be maintained. Second that. Thank you. Any further, uh, any further discussion? All in favor? All right. Councillor Morris. Oh, sorry, I was. Okay. The next is that the committee of the whole recommend to council that the Bowen Island Public Library Board's request for 368,504 be approved or be adjusted to blank. That one maybe should be left so we can. Okay. Yeah. Um, that the committee of the whole recommend to council that the locals in this area five year, I think we've covered that off, but I don't think we need to do that one. Okay, carrying on. <clears throat> that the committee of the whole recommend to council that the request for additional staff FTE at a cost of 89,000 be approved, not approved. <clears throat> um, I, <that's> <clears throat> I don't want to just flatly turn it down because I don't know that I've had a really good presentation as to why we should. There's no, unless I've missed a written report. Um, I think it was part of the uh, manager's presentation on that. Yeah, so I, there's been no sort of written report giving us a, uh, you know, a one pager laying out why they need this position and what the benefits will be and will it save us any money elsewhere. Morning. Uh, just a question is, is the um, additional staff and costs are those costs included in the proposed budget? Another outside of that. So if the 89A were approved, it would increase the rate about 10.4%? Yeah. Thank you. 
No. I, 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 so given all of that, I'm going to move that the committee as a whole recommend to council that the request for additional staff FTE at cost $89,000 not be approved. I will second that. <clears throat> so, um, having said that, it, it, is, it is incredibly tough. Um, we haven't got it in the budget right now. I am sure that it would not have been put forward had there not been a perfectly sensible reason to do so. The fact that, that such small staff increases have been requested suggests to me that this has been considered very carefully. Could we recognize that this at the moment sits outside the budget? And I'm not sure the correct procedure. Could we perhaps review this when we have a little bit more certainty on a couple of other things in three months' time? Could we could I'm trying to look for a mechanism which recognizes the fact that this is obviously probably very much needed. And we are doing nobody any great favors right now with, with, with the workload by saying no. But we're asking it to be considered, uh, held out there to be to be resubmitted with a report in a three year in three months time, where maybe we have a little bit more information uh, on some other on some other issues that we're waiting for. Okay, thank you, Michael. Going to go through and then Maureen. Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, I'm um, I'm not in favor of raising the rate above ten point four. I'm uh, not in favor of uh, <coughs> putting something into the budget that was not in the draft that went for consultation, if I'm understanding it correctly. No, it, it was it was um, included as something that was outside of it. Outside, yeah. okay. And um, so anyway, I'm, uh, I don't think we should be adding more full-time staff equipment at this uh, time, unless somebody can convince me otherwise. I, I, as I recall, it was uh, public works and parks, and there were good reasons for uh, finance, and uh, there were good reasons for all the positions. I just don't see that adding staff um, and raising the percentage, I'm not in favor of that. Okay, Maureen? Uh, one of the points that we've been talking about um, and that Councillor Wyman brought up that initially was in regards to some of the public works yeah. and projects that are going to be done in, in the coming year where the work has to be contracted out and uh, we're bringing in off-island contractors or off-island employers who are hiring, hiring locals and that there, it might actually be more cost effective to have a staff person undertaking that work. So as part of um, uh, Councillor Kale's recommendation of let's look at this again in three months time, perhaps in three months time, we could get a bit more of a business <coughs> um, that, would, we have to, yeah. that would support you know, or, or not support a decision to bring somebody on not as an addition to the budget, but as in fact a cost-saving measure in, in the, also developing expertise yeah. um, uh, um, among our staff. But at this point, I, I am not supporting. Um, no, unfortunately, the timing is a bit, of a, it's a bit of a conflict in the timing here. Yeah, that's what I'm confused about. In three months' time, don't we have to have it budget passed? Yeah, it wouldn't be in this year's I budget. I think Maureen was saying, um, a business case to support the fact that we would not be needing to raise extra money. This person, if it was an extra person, well, that's correct. But I'm, I'm just wondering yeah. if, if that could happen mid budget. Well, we're not, no, okay. it wouldn't affect the tax rates or anything. It's a business case that if we do X, we don't, we don't have to do well, that. That would be fine if, if, we could, if we could do it. If, yeah. the, if there's an ability to do that, say three months, four months down the road or whatever, once we get a business case for it. And it looks good. Is that a possibility? You might have well, to... also certainly as the year progresses, you're going to um, identify areas where you uh, likely won't spend your entire budget, or yeah. you, if there are any surpluses that are apparent, they will you will be aware of them by the time you know September rolls around. So, um, 
the decision to defer also uh, reduces the actual cost for the year. So mm -hmm. it's a it's a smaller piece. Um, again, I, I I think that it's uh, just important that council it be the one to approve FTE. Yeah. On an basis. I just uh, I, you know if that business case case does come up, we we could save a lot of potentially save a lot of money in the, in the public works department. Um, but if we can't, if the business case doesn't prove to be real, and it's kind of hard to say because we don't have, we've had, we've had we don't have the information yet. We don't have the information, and a lot of it would be assumptive because we're not doing the work. So we're just assuming that we're going to save X number of dollars. Um, it's a tough one, but I, I think at this point in time, without the information, um, and that's, you know, it's, it's a percentage, it's 1% per 50,000. Yeah. I'll, I'll make the motion. So I already just one more. Did you? That's all Sorry. right, in a, in a second. I just had a call. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, just, uh, I mean, just to dovetail a bit on that, I, I think we do need to, to be able to show how we can save that money. I guess one of my concerns here as well is, you know, it's pretty rich, proud, foolish. And you see that with the potholes right now, you know, the small little pothole, yeah. you know, three weeks later is four times the size. And if we don't have staff to deal with the little problems, which is sort of what it's looking yeah, like right now, true. they start turning into really big problems. And now the costs actually start escalating. So a lot of times what looks like, hey, we're saving your money on an FTE here in the long run actually winds up costing us way more money and more problems and less services. So, um, and I know we're all thinking about this and that's, that's a, a, a just something that we need to keep in mind that it sometimes seems like, oh, we just want to hire one person to save 80 grand. Sometimes you can actually create more of a problem by doing that. So um, it's just a bit of that awareness. Well, yeah, unfortunately, like so I said, 10.4% is it's pushing. It's a timing issue out here right now. I've been building on these cars. They're going to slightly different position. That's it. I, I'd like to see, you know, down at the bottom, we're going to talk about the 10.4. Well, I'd sure like to find ways to bring that down uh, and certainly not go higher. But I'd like this building on this idea, like I, I don't know exactly what these FTEs are for. Yes. If these, I'd like to have a second look at that as part of the overall budget. If we can bring that number down a little bit, that if some of these FTEs are needed as part of that work, so I'd rather, I'd rather rather than ditching that right now, I'd uh, I'd rather have that as part of a, a second look at the entire budget to see is there anything that we can find to reduce this a little bit, and maybe these FTEs or one of them can fit in. I don't know, but I'd rather have it looked altogether, looked at altogether, rather than okay, let's ditch this and maybe we'll run into trouble. Somewhere else. I look at the whole thing, please. And so this this is down to our last discussion about the ten point four. Make sure we're not over ten point four. Get below it if we possibly can. Have one more look at everything. And so that would include also the library one that we've got. You know, after the ten point four. So in other words, let's have a look at everything. See if we can bring it down. And maybe the FT is either in there, or maybe they're not. I don't know because I don't know. Yeah, I don't think that's. I think I agree with. Is rather more holistic approach to this. But we, we, we know at the moment it, it's, it's not a go. As we move, we still have a few days. We're not going to finalize the budget yet. I know, I know most CEOs, CAOs by their board would say, if that is important to you at a cost of X, right, and this is the amount of money we have to spend, show us from where else it's going to come from. Because you will balance your priority. You're doing nothing else, and every household and every other business I hear across this country is doing right now. You have a finite amount, or less ideally, maybe to your point. And if that's the maybe your big priority, take it out of somebody else because you've got some tough choices to make like everybody else. You're not exempt from making tough choices. No, I agree. I, I think we need more, more information on it, and, and hopefully we can. We can wheel it back and and, and get that um, if something if we can prove a case that's not going to cost us more money then um, I think we can do that and so yeah I'll, 
or to find other money to cut back sales. Yeah, that's true that. too. Yeah. Uh, Maybe so, we can find do you want the wording to say that the community of the whole recommend to council that the request for additional staff FTE at a cost of 89000 not be approved at this time? Well, you can say that, but I mean, we're well, getting, pretty, getting pretty close to the deadline. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. If you really want this, and yeah. I'm assuming the 89000 is a year's salary, not a half a year. So if you really want to spend this forty odd thousand dollars, yeah. then you've got to wait to figure out where the money's going to come from. Sure. Okay, I like I like that amendment. Is everybody happy with that? Yes. Thank you. Okay. At this time. And uh, okay, so I'll ask a question all in favor. Aye. Aye. Okay, Allison. Oh. <laughs> 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 I'm going to roll here. Is that what you think? Yeah, yeah. No, did you vote? No, did you vote? Oh yes. Yeah, so okay, thank you. That's good. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> all right. And, uh, Excellent. That the committee of the whole recommend to council that the 2022 grant to Bowen Island tourism not remain at twenty thousand dollars. Second, uh, I like to take this one on the face because I, I spent my life in tourism, and quite honestly, uh, we don't know what we going to expect. But my message to the tourism people is same thing. We're all having to make difficult decisions here. See if you can find some volunteers. You know, it's funny, the library have volunteers, Knickknack Nook have volunteers, umpteen other people have volunteers. I I'm not sure why some wonderful people helping some wonderful visitors couldn't be augmented by some volunteers. I don't know why it isn't possible, because I'm sorry, we're going to have to look for some alternative solutions. Are you going to sign this number one volunteer? I, I, I actually would probably be quite good at it. <laughs> so, uh, and I, I, except I probably missed about correct people. Horrible. <laughs> uh, apart from that, you know, allowing for my usual transgression. Right? But I, no, and I, I want to say, because I've been in tourism my life, and I think I'm the one who should take this one on, on the chin. And, and I'm sorry. You know, you can't ask one set of people to make a difficult choice and then ask another set of people, oh, sure. Oh, oh, not that we're doing that, but I mean, they, they, everyone has to take their share of, 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 the, of their responsibilities here. Okay. Uh, any further comment? I'll ask a question. All in favor? I see that. I think. Thank you. So, so the committee will recommend to council that you don't want to go back to do the library? No, we're not doing okay. it right now. I think we have to ask them to look at ways to reduce their budget. Um, the library budget is included in full in the 10.4%. If council is comfortable with 10.4, then there's no need to go back to the library board to ask for adjustments. If council's not comfortable with 10.4%, then I think um, that would be a consideration to go and request the library board to see if there are any available adjustments. So I think it's important to determine your comfort level with the 10.4 first. Would it just well, on the law of minimum scale? That's just supposing the library board were to make an adjustment. Just, just supposing. And it may I just throw out a bigger, let me say 50,000 for the sake of argument, right? Yeah. Okay, we take 50,000 off our budget. Does it change 10.4 to anything? Does it make it nine? What, what, is it, what does it change? It's a little over 9.5. a little bit. Uh, 1% would be about 61,000, so just like okay. right. to understand. So would, it, would it be possible to say what we have in front of us right now is 10.4, allowing for a library budget as it stands as presented. Mm -hmm. um, and we recognize 10.4 on the understanding that we're going back to the library board to, to review their ask. No, I don't think Council so. hasn't considered that motion. No, but, but I mean, if that would that be a valid motion to say, okay, we have 10.4 on the table, and wrapped up in that is the library ask. Um, the library is an independent board, so yeah, they establish their annual budget. Yep. They provide it to Council to tell you this is what we need to operate our library. Council really has two options. You can accept it, or you can... Uh, approve a lower amount or, or a bigger amount. You can approve a different amount. You yep. can accept it or you can approve a different amount. So um, we don't have to actually tell them what amount it is tonight. We can tell them Correct. we're unhappy with the amount. Correct. And given we've got this overall 10.4, could you please look at your exactly. budget and see what you So you don't have to move that 
option. Okay, so I'm, I'm trying to find the best way to phrase yeah. this. So just yeah. don't uh, don't approve the motion at this time. And, okay. uh, and then the other is there is a portion of the operating budget that isn't salary related, and um, and so whether it's to me, I would also like to ask staff to look at their budgets and and see if there isn't somewhere places that they could trim or find other sources. So, which is consistent with our financial policy. I'm I'm happy with that, Mayor Just you know, I'm looking to, for the best way to phrase this. That we can, we can get we them to, to look at these. We're getting a lot of comments from the, the library. Wasn't yeah. wasn't out of line with their normal increase. No. Right? Well, but maybe we've been a little seven percent call now. So yeah, that's, that's you know they've had, you know, they got it. Yeah, one of those increases was actually staff. And I don't know how much surplus we've never actually seen their financial statements. So, can I just say, yep. um, as the uh, council liaison to the library board, um, that during the time of uh, uh, COVID, uh, they've been a really um, significant player in the, in holding the tapestry of the community together. Um, I would say, in terms of uh, uh, making their programs work, um, going digital. Uh, making um, uh, computers available to people and uh, helping people with the um, uh, digital skills that people needed to suddenly have in order to participate in um, uh, all the regular things that we suddenly, when everybody went online. So there's a, a lot of, um, uh, not only the agility, but a lot of uh, uh, benefits of service to the community that they've been doing through the course of time and um uh, they're kind of um uh i wouldn't well anyway i'm not in support of reducing uh the budget ask because their the demand for those kinds of services is uh rising as COVID continues so yeah. thank you uh, gary i'm very pleased with the work of library uh, just like I'm very pleased with all the work that the municipality does, um, but I'm not pleased with 10.47%. So in the number seven, I'd like not to support 10.47%, and I'd like our staff to have one more look, um, and this would include the library board, that would include everybody. Mm -hmm. Have one more look, please, and see what you can do to reduce it. Um, um, I, we've had excellent presentations. Chris and you give us really good presentations. You've explained that there's not a heck of a lot of room there and that there's no question that we need to be putting money into reserves. I really support that. Um, so I don't know where, where you're going to find some magic. Uh, and Liam will find some magic and, and other managers, but I ask you to have a look. That's and give them and, and whether it, I'm not targeting the library or anybody else, everybody does great work. Thank you. Great. Um, so we're not going to touch that 10.4? Well, I think we, yeah. we would like to see it below. Yeah. Well, sure, everybody would like to see it below. I'd like to see it at 3%, but well, it's I not. That's not a reality. That's the unfortunate thing. And we keep kicking it back all the time, and that's why we're in the problem. Yeah, I'm, I'm not saying kick it back very much, just try and get it down yeah. a little bit. And if I could add a little bit to people who might be listening, I mean, yes, we heard a presentation tonight about how all kinds of other municipalities have rates that are much lower than this, but uh, some don't. Other small municipalities like us have rates well over 10%, or they've had them for 10 years of over 10% in order to build up reserves that yes, we haven't done. Exactly. And, and so we're behind. Yes. And sorry about this. Yeah. But, you know, we're a small community. Um, we have... Um, because we're an island, we have to have facilities that other people wouldn't be able to share. Like, you know, we need the bigger fire hall. We need a health center because if there was a bridge to Horseshoe Bay, you wouldn't need a health center. It's not cool. We can have it there. So, you know, we have extra needs. We have more miles of road per person than any other municipality in the region. Yeah. So we got a lot of extra costs. Yes. We haven't been putting the money into reserve that we should have. So I'm not for, you know, cutting back on that. but. Just see what we can do to read. Uh, you know what? Somebody, somebody was talking about the different tax rates and 
you know, Vancouver, Burnaby, we can't compare ourselves to Vancouver, Burnaby. You've got to look at, you got to look at municipalities our size and tons and everything like that. And what they're paying, I can guarantee you that probably at least 50 or 60 percent of them, because I look, there are over 10 percent. Because we can't, we don't have the tax base to afford to do the, the work we're doing. And the bottom line is, it's, it, it, it is what it is. It costs this much money. And uh, I, you know, sure we can try to scrape some more off, but I, we've been scraping for so long now. It's, yeah. And the problem is, we kick it back two percent, David. Yeah. We're going to be looking at that two percent next year, and that's going to be up twelve percent. Yeah. Um, I mean, these are these are just unfortunately these are just real numbers, and I, as much as I would like to back it off, you know, we could take a pay cut. Sure, that'd be great, but I don't think it's going to get us anywhere. The question was brought up and. I don't think it was addressed. Uh, just if we're going back to staff to ask them yeah. to look at things uh, again, would we provide staff with? You know, it would be nice to see a five percent or a ten percent reduction. Is that doable? Is I mean, is that a good strategy? Well, so like the question that I'm used to asking is. If you were asked to cut your budget by 5%, what would you cut and what would the impacts of doing that be? And then we could then decide whether that's an impact. That's well, I mean, the people are, are complaining about the increase, but you'll also hear them complaining about the fact that they want the potholes fixed and they want the roadside clearing done and they want, you know, the bylaws enforced and all that sort of stuff. So you can't, it's maybe it's the fine balance of maybe if people actually, you know, sharpen their pencils, as Jimmy Patterson said, anybody could find 5% in their budget. It seems to be a master at least. So, so. so. thank you. Um, I saw Liam's hand as well. I um, I just wanted to say, I think uh, I agree with what uh, Councillor Hawking and others have said. Um, as a small municipality, uh, we're also facing climate change. And uh, I think what we've heard about the uh, sewer in Snug Cove, I have an uh, email from Metro Vancouver saying Metro Vancouver Region, this is from the board uh, newsletter, uh, Metro Vancouver Region has been facing increasing challenges from climate change induced events such as atmospheric rivers alongside aging public and private assets. These challenges have led to higher levels of inflow and infiltration, compromising da, 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 sanitary sewer systems infrastructure. That would, to me, would include roads. And, uh, and I, I think we should be making sure we've got some reserves for those. We have to repair the sewer, uh, wastewater sewer plant because it's a pollution issue. So these things are already happening. And um, I'm not saying it's all climate change, but that's another thing that's coming at us down the road, and I want to be prepared for that. So I'm um, <laughs> I'm not uh, convinced that we're going to be able to get it down much lower, frankly. Mm -hmm. And um, I I think uh, um, for the next couple of years we might have to get over this. Uh, Take our belts. Yeah. yeah, but also get over this hurdle of having what I think of as public infrastructure, which is the community center and the fire hall and some of these places where we can uh, be more self-sufficient, ruggedize ourselves as a community and in terms of uh, being uh, more able to pull the community together in an emergency, for example, or um, not to have to travel uh, and uh, have a car or whatever, pay the ferry to go off island. So some of these things I think might actually be saving uh, individual households money to perhaps uh, lower fire insurance rates, for example. We don't know exactly what those things are, but I think it all uh, helps individual households as well. So I'm not... Uh, uh, You're okay with 10.4? Well, I'd like to get it lower, but I am okay with 10.4 yep, at this moment. Um, okay, so Can I get one last thing. I guess oh, sure. my issue is I'm looking at various things in our financial policies. I just want to have the comfort of knowing that staff has gone through their budgets with a fine tooth comb and there's nothing in there that isn't necessary or could maybe be done with it. That's not, but keeping our assets in a good state of repair. I'm not talking about cutting reserves or anything like that. 
for doing the good maintenance that we need to be done. But, you know, are there things in there that, well, it would be really nice to do this. I'm not sure if we can get it done this year, but maybe I'll put it in the budget. You know, that, those kinds of things. Liam, do you want to <laughs> chat? Yeah, uh, just a comment. Thank you, Mayor. Yeah. Um, and uh, these are all really great comments and helpful for us. And I think it's always uh, a good idea to go back and have a second look. And so I appreciate that. And we, we will do that. And, um, but I, I can say with certainty that staff have gone through this. We, we did, as staff, start this budget process before Kristen joined us, but we started it only as individual departments. And, and we didn't really examine it in any great detail until Kristen came along and has done wonders for us. But um, so there has been a lot of attention paid to it and there has been a lot of things cut out. The original FTE ask was much greater and that has been cut back significantly. Um, and I also want to just come back to a point that we often talk about and that's the percentage itself. And the percentages are misleading because we should really be talking about real numbers because when we hear a reference to the city of Burnaby having a tax rate increase of 2.3%, well, that is pushing uh, $7 million, right? So a 1% tax increase in Burnaby is north of $3 million. A 1% tax increase on Bowen is $60,000. A 1% tax increase in West Bend is north of a million dollars. So it, it's not, we can't compare ourselves to Richmond and Burnaby, you know, those types of places. Um, so I, I prefer to talk about real numbers, and we're talking about about six hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars, which is a lot of money. But the bulk of that is going towards um, bolstering our reserves and capital initiatives that are absolutely critical. Having said all that, it's a good practice to go back, have a second look, see if we can find some things. Um, it may be small things, but every little bit helps and counts. So. And I just pick that back. Um, and Rob, you going too? Sorry. Go ahead, Michael. Oh, no, that's fine. Go ahead, Michael. Uh, you know, I really, I, I think a couple of very important points made. Cash, definitely a little percent. Couldn't agree with you more. I haven't met an ATM machine that's accepted percentages yet. <laughs> So that, that is one. You mentioned something before Kristen arrived. But in that period of time, actually, the world looked up. As a, as a, as a what we're facing right now. And so, as a result of all that, it does our borrowing environment in terms of our interest rates. We've actually had uh, some very significant changes take place over the last three or four months. Totally unexpected. And it's just something that we're all having to do with. I happen to think we are very close to where we need to get here. So I think the distinguished comments are we're going to look at it and again, we're going to give absolute everyone total comfort. There's no stone unturned. And let's just see what we can do because, you know, it's a pretty bright bunch of people you have working with you, uh, Liam. And I'm frankly going to leave it to you and their ingenuity to see what they can come up with. But I believe we're close. I, I have no problem with the 10 point whatever, other than it's 10 point whatever, because I accept it's 10 point whatever. But uh, in terms of the fine tuning and everybody giving a bit, including the library, then I, I'm absolutely fine with that too. So I think we can probably move on. I think it's been a good day to work. Uh, so, Kristen, if you got as much of all we give you as much information, I think, as we can. That's actually a really a strong vote of confidence, good. right? As opposed to a very prescriptive, do not come back with anything less than yeah. this. No, yeah. it's, I think, from a staff perspective, it's actually quite empowering to say we trust you to do the best job that you can do what you have. And please just have a second look and come back to us. I think we've all heard that message. And, yeah. And um, we won't let you down. <laughs> All right. How are we doing on time? I just, uh, that's not for tonight, you mean, generally, for the, for the process. No, I just wanted to so the process. The last question I have is how much of the 650 or 770 or whatever it is increase in the um, tax revenue is going to be covered off by the increase, the non market increase in the tax growth? 
That was worth about fifty nine thousand. How much? Fifty nine thousand. Okay, so so that's a one. So six hundred grand. So that takes it down to nine point four. No, I, I haven't. I, I didn't break it out separately. It's. Oh, I've been there already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Nice try, though. <laughs> so, okay, the comment I was going to make is, you know, the parcel taxes as well, because it's tax tax, right? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, and and I think you know I would like us to take a look at that as well. Um, you know, I'll give you an example: is the garbage compost six hundred fourteen dollars? So that's that's a lot of money, and you know, I haven't composted it. An orange peel ever on Bowen Island. I compost it at home, mm -hmm. but you know that three hundred and fifty dollars I'm putting out every year for other people that don't want to compost at home. Mm -hmm. I'm paying for it. I'm doing it on my own. And I think you know we as a community have to start looking at you know where are we going to be? Like you brought up community resilience and all that. You know this door to door pickup of compost. Maybe that's a luxury that we can't afford anymore. Well, it's a contract right now. I know it's a contract, but it's something that sure. you know as a community we may have to start looking at. You know this. Being on our own. You know it doesn't come for free, right? This is all cost, and three hundred fifty dollars is too. Two full days of work for me, like when I do my community costs, two days away from the family, and I'm getting nothing. I actually want people to bring compost to my house, right? And here we are shipping it away. You oh, turn over, I got to pile. Say that too loudly. To me, the topsoil, you know. Yeah. So, so I think as a larger community, we need to really start looking at what are where are we going to put our priorities. And there's some people that are hugely impacted by this. You know, like I'm a homeowner and my property value went up 24 24%. I'm doing okay, you know, but if you're not a property owner and you're getting the $300 extra dollar bill, you know, financially, it's a huge hit to these families because they're not getting this asset. Yeah, property you're in your own and I'm not yeah, deferring you your house. Yeah, and then you defer your taxes to or some younger people. Yeah. Care. So yeah. I think we need to just be wary of that. Well, it's nice getting my compost picked up, but for other people, it's days away from the family, you know, and that's something that they can maybe do at home and spend time with the family. So, right. so maybe looking like the parcel taxes, I'd like to see like where are there opportunities where, you know, this is a nice to have, but in these times of like these escalating costs and like Councillor Fassett, we're probably going to keep going up and up by the looks of things. We're going to need to look at some of this stuff. So. Well, contract time anyway. There's no question yeah. about it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, the parcel taxes are actually the cost of the service divided by the the number. No, so it's not like we don't have the opportunity to set a you know a parcel tax that has any room to to be considered a different amount. It's really right. just a straight mathematical yeah. calculation of the as Marianne said, the cost of the contract divided by the you also have Metro Translink, Islands Trust, yeah. you know, everybody's just picking away. So, uh, okay, so uh, do we need that other, uh, any other resolution in there? I hope we shouldn't, uh, if we've made no I, I don't think we need a resolution, okay. I think that uh, the CAO and Mike myself, we can communicate uh, council's message to the rest okay. of the staff and we will add That's super. We await your return. Okay. Thank you very much, Chris. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so we are now going to uh, reconvene the regular council meeting, and uh, the recommendation will be by consensus. We'll move on to 8.5, which is a detached secondary suite minimum lot size review. The results of the referrals, that's over to Daniel Martin, who should be on the big screen. There he is. I love that. <laughs> Uh, go ahead, Daniel. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. So um, I have a final presentation for tonight about the project to examine detached secondary suite lot size. All right. So um, as council knows, but as a way of um, refreshment, so bylaw 414, 2016 established a de detached secondary suites on Bowen and permitted lots to construct a detached secondary suite for properties with a minimum lot size of 0 0.36 hectares. Um, January 24th council meeting, council adopted a motion to um, refer the staff report from that meeting to the housing advisory committee and the advisory planning commission for input on the desired minimum lot size for detached secondary suites. Um, so I bring in those to you tonight. 
And this also just by way of recap, this was what was in that um, report that went to the January council meeting is looking at um, what are lot sizes of residential properties on Bowen Island and found roughly a third or about 880 are large enough to permit detached secondary suites. Um, about a third or another 880 are smaller than 0.15 hectares. And the remaining third of lots on Bowen are, are somewhere in between sort of um, nicely staggered as they as they reduce in size between those, those two um, brackets. So going to the APC, they considered at their March meeting um, and they supported eliminating the minimum lot size required to allow a detached secondary suite provided that other conditions including water, septic, parking and setbacks are met. So they um, considered should this be reduced to a, a smaller size, smaller than 0.36 and eventually they came to the um, recommendation that, that instead that other existing regulations um, are sufficient and that there should just be no minimum lot size. Um, and the Housing Advisory Committee discussed this in February um, and they came to a similar recommendation to council. So whereas there's other zoning restrictions, floor space ratio, site coverage, lot line setbacks, water and sewer in place in the land use bylaw, and there's a development permit guidelines in place, they recommended that council direct staff to remove the minimum lot size requirement to build detached secondary suites. Um, and then they made a follow-on motion that in the near future, the land use bylaw be reviewed to consider floor space ratios and incentives for construction of secondary suites and other desired housing forms. Um, and so that would be a similar approach to you saw earlier tonight in the rezoning on Milk Creek, which um, provided an incentive for providing secondary suites. Um, so one of the things I looked at is that the detached secondary suite bylaw regulates the maximum floor area that a detached secondary suite can be. And it does it as a percentage or as a flat amount. And then it's a percentage of overall lot size. And I apologize, this might be hard to read um, from where you are, but in essence, when your lot is 0.8 hectares in size um, or two acres, roughly, you would hit the maximum lot size permitted of 115 square meters. And the way that the bylaw and the formula works is that when you are 0.4 hectares in size or one acre, you are permitted 90 square meters for a detached secondary suite, which is the same size that you're permitted in an attached secondary suite that's part of a home. So as your lot size moves smaller than that, um, you're actually permitted, a, your detached secondary suite permitted would be smaller than that if it was attached as part of a house. Um, so this is something that I had looked at in light of the, the recommendations from the APC and the, the housing advisory committees looking at, okay, if we no longer had a, minimum lot size and anybody could build a detached secondary suite. Um, the incentives would be in place so that people could build, the secondary suite you would build would be larger if it's in your, as part of your house on a smaller lot than if it's a detached secondary suite. Um, yeah. Which was sort of an interesting you know, consequence of that, of that ratio. Um, highlight it there. Um, the other thing to consider, so um, there's a development permit in place for form and character of detached secondary suites. The guidelines consist of a total of eight points and primarily focus on the retention of existing landscaping and the siting of the detached secondary suite so as not to impact the privacy of neighboring properties. Um, and this point also ties to, I think, what um, our CAO was talking about earlier for the site alteration bylaw is that currently the detached secondary suite development permit guidelines talk about you know, maintaining existing landscaping and especially existing mature trees. But we actually don't have other um, bylaws that would, would protect that. So often we'll see a place where people have had already cleared a site and prepared it for the detached secondary suite to be built there, at which point they apply for the development permit to govern form and character. And it's quite challenging at that point to, um, to regulate the, the landscaping conditions of the development permit and say, well, you, you need to maintain existing mature trees. Well, you know, there may have been mature trees there, but by the time the application comes to us, um, they don't exist anymore. So it's, it's sort of a, a tricky one to, um, to regulate. But, but staff would recommend um, and would conduct a review of these guidelines if council wants to proceed with a, a reduced lot size for detached secondary suites. So right now they're, they're fairly minimal, um, acknowledging that in most cases, lots are large enough that you can cite it so that it's not impacting neighboring properties. Um, as lot sizes reduce, that you can have a detached secondary suite, maybe that's something that, that we should pay more attention to to regulate. Um, and then finally, the last point is um, residential guest accommodation. So the land use bylaw currently permits an accessory use of residential guest accommodation 
So which is the, this is the short-term rental provision. So it's an accessory use of a dwelling unit or a portion of one that is ordinarily occupied as a residence as a temporary accommodation for a paying guest for a period of less than 30 consecutive days. Um, and just highlighting staff's interpretation of this definition is that the use of a dwelling solely as a residential guest accommodation with no normal occupant is not consistent with the permitted use in the land use bylaw. So it's one that is challenging to um, regulate and typically we're looking for you know, the, the, the business license applicants um, essentially signature that they're, that, you know, that they meet the definition of it. But in this sense, we look at it in particular when building a, a secondary dwelling on a property. Um, is, it, is it solely intended as a residential guest accommodation, which it's hard to say that it's ordinarily occupied as a resident and so may not be meeting the definition of, of that RGA use. Um, of the licensed RGAs on Bowen, 13 are in attached suites, 7 are in detached suites, and 26 are in primary dwellings. Um, so through the review of existing regulations, in doing this review, and also in, in working through the rezoning at, um, on Malkin Creek as well, concerns have been raised that the provision of detached secondary suites will not contribute to providing rental housing if the suites are instead just used as RGA units. Um, so council may wish to consider and staff recommend including regulations in the accessory residential use regulations such that an accessory residential use is not permitted to be used as an RGA or alternatively it could be placed on detached secondary suites or um, council could consider prohibiting on detached secondary suites on lots that are smaller than 0.36 hectares. Um, so the recommendation that's before you is council direct staff to prepare a bylaw to amend the land use bylaw to remove the required minimum lot size for detached secondary suites and to prohibit an accessory residential use from being used as a residential guest accommodation and that council direct staff to bring the prepared bylaw to a future council meeting for consideration of first reading. Thank you. All right, thank you, Daniel. Well done. Uh, questions? Rob, I see you and then Sumela. Yeah, Daniel, we had a report several months ago uh, where you sort of summed up the development potential of unbuilt areas of uh, house and just pulled it out across Bowen Island. What impact will a decision here tonight have on, on the potential for more development of Bowen Island? Gotcha. Um, I guess I, I would say it wouldn't have potential. So this would be about changing the minimum lot size where lots could have a detached secondary suite in places where they're already permitted an attached secondary suite. So it would be changing the form of um, potential secondary dwelling on a property, but not increasing the potential. Um, and then as I talked about in the floor area, by definition, then if, if no changes are made to the floor area calculation, then permitting detached secondary suites on lots smaller than 0.36 hectares the detached secondary suites would be smaller in area than an already permitted attached secondary suite. Thank you. Um, thank you. I'm, uh, I take your point about the loss of trees. Um, uh, I'm, I've, well, watching what's happening in Vancouver when they allowed uh, coach housing, oops, sorry, laneway housing or co coach housing, um, they lost a lot of the urban trees. And uh, I'm uh, concerned on small lots. I wonder, um, I don't see anything in your report about the official, <coughs> excuse me, the official community plan, which I just did a quick search for the words minimum lot size. I think it's just talking about dwellings and not, or uh, about lot size is not how many homes you can put on. Um, but it does say like policy 162 is about uh, minimum lot size, the land use by will contain regulations to ensure that the size of the houses on small lots is in keeping with the scale and character of the village ambiance. And then 134 on um, some bigger lots, and it's about retaining the rural character, the, the minimum lot size. Uh, so both of these seem to me to, to speak to how we're different from uh, the mainland, we're outside of the urban containment boundary where we have village character, we have rural character, we have a preserve and protect mandate to keep our island character. And um, uh, and this is uh, uh, not the same. I, I want to, um, uh, I'm not, it, 
I appreciate the need for diversity of housing, but I worry that allowing uh, detached secondary suites in smaller lots um, will prevent us from uh, maintaining the scale and character of village ambiance and this really small ones and the rural character. And uh, it's not the same as clustering. Uh, and it's not, you know, that, that's in our conservation development policy. This is spreading it out, uh, sprinkling it, sort of. And uh, I'm, um, and I wonder about uh, increasing property values. Like, if we do this, will it make property, properties even more expensive and exclude even more people? So I'm, um, I want to keep us as a charismatic exer, but also as uh, 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 affordable and with our unique character. Um, and I would like to use density transfer and some of these other tools we've got rather than um, to bring development into the cove is what the density transfer business is all about rather than more suburban kinds of sprinkling everywhere. So that's my my concern. I'm uh, I'm I'm concerned with the minimum lot size part. I won't be supporting more detached dwellings on small lot sizes. Um, but I'm fine with the uh, uh, proposal about the. Um, the what do you call it? Yeah. What is it? Uh, re residential. Yes. Yes. Um, thank you. <laughs> Um, about the yeah the the, the guest accommodation, um, I uh, I think we need it for long term housing rental. That's uh, the priority that I see. So that's that's my thoughts. Unless unless I'm wrong about um, anything there, that's my thoughts. Yeah. Hey, Sue Ellen. Oh. Sorry. Go ahead. Ben. Or, sorry. Oh. I was, just, I was just going to respond. I mean, I think the two policies that you quote in the OCP are specific for the Snug Cove um, residential area and relate to specifically the 162 allowing, you know, smaller lot sizes than we currently permit. Okay. We, yeah. Okay, I take that. That's fine. That, that, that's what I was thinking, but I, I still think the point about... Uh, Retain the scale and character of village ambiance and the uh, means of rural character for the other one. I, those are two important things that I see from the official community plan. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Gary, and uh, thank you. So I support this. Um, you know, this is a recommendation that comes out of the Volunteers Housing Committee. Um, I was in the discussion at the Advisory Planning Commission, and so and. Um, the issues around, um, well, no, the issues around um, um, character and so on, um, it was not a worry. Um, the, the affordability of housing is, is really more important. I mean, the same discussions are going on in Vancouver where people want to preserve their single family areas um, because of the you know, form and character. Well, um, that's fine for people who are my age who already bought the thing when it was, you know, tiny. Hardly cost anything, but it means our kids and our grandkids have got nowhere to go. So I'm I'm in support of this. Um, the one concern that I have is the one that was raised by one of the letters that talks about well we're changing the rules midway for someone. And so I then Daniel suggested in your report the prohibition of RGAs on lots less than 0.36 hectares means it does it's not changing the rules on somebody who's already done something. So yeah. I'm supportive of this. Yeah. I'm supporting that it, it shouldn't be RGAs. On these little ones, uh, but they kind of change the rules on that we already had for ones that were above 0. 0.36. Okay. Yeah, that's okay. really that's a, <laughs> good points, and I think um, you know we need housing. We need housing, and there's only so many ways we're going to get it. We're not going to get it in the cold because we can't. We don't have a sewer there to make it happen for the next three or four years. We need housing, and this is one way to get it. Get somebody else, you know, to to fund it. Um, I, I like both parts of this, and obviously, there's you know there's restrictions on both sides. Some some lots are going to be just too small. And we'll be able to put them on. Yeah, there's still that you know side lots. And, I mean, yeah, yeah, true. Uh, anybody else? Michael? 
Can I? Can I? Can I just? Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Just, just respond to Councillor Hawking. So, people who have existing licensed RGAs in a in a secondary suite would be an existing non-conforming use and could continue the use as long as it um, is operated as such. So okay. it would change the rules for people who have already built but haven't, like don't have a operating business, would, wouldn't have that option, but people who are currently operating um, would continue. Okay, that's great. Thank you, Daniel. Yeah. And, 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 and Daniel, listen, thank you for that clarification. Because I think it underscores another thing as well. So someone who's already got their license and they're operating quite properly, gone through the process, say grandfather would be, if you like, a, a, maybe not a technically correct term, but they, they needn't worry that the, the rules are going to be applied retrospectively. Correct. Correct. Okay, that is really important because if we're to agree to this, and, and I can see all the reasons why we should, in a way, what we have to do is serve notice. Because if these are to be the new existing rules, it's rather like the, the property taxes, the one on one. You know, you, you can't suddenly change them. You, if you're going to make it, if you're going to do this, we're going to have to say, and probably we should, by the way, change. that from a certain date, which does not track people who are under construction right now and all the other stuff, that, that beyond this date, that these rules will apply. Um, I know I know grandfathering is, is, is a bit messy, but also it, it is desperately unkind and hugely unfair to change the rules on people when they've already conformed with all things. So we can take it and go back to these people uh, who mentioned and say, look, we understand. What if, was your term used illegally non-conforming? Legal non legally non legally non-conforming. Legal non Legal non-conforming. Okay, should they should they apply for something which actually gives them a statement of fact to agree that they are legally non-conforming, or is it just a given that they are legally non-conforming? Yeah. I think they need um, to be. <laughs> one, one of the the benefits of our business licensing bylaw is that it, yeah. it makes it simpler in terms of if somebody's licensed to operate, then then there's a clear statement they've received a, a license from the municipality that they are legally operating at the time, and, and then they could continue. I'm thrilled that they succumbed to my arm twisting about getting a business license. Maureen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just I'm looking at the correspondence that we received on this point, and I'm not clear on whether these folks have actually built their um, detached secondary suite or are simply considering of building their detached secondary suite. So it may be a bit more complicated. Could be. Than, uh, than it, it might appear um, initially. Uh, I'll be voting in support of, uh, of the moving forward with the bylaw. And also, I, I like the idea, Daniel, of uh, the, the break point for permitting the uh, legal non-conforming legal non-conforming use. And I'm, I'm really pleased that this is being received as well as it is uh, by council because there's been an enormous amount of work put into um, thinking this through and all, all the related issues at the uh, at the housing advisory committee. Um, and I, I think that there probably would be significant if, if um, we get a bylaw in place, um, revised bylaw, um, that there would be significant interest from members of the public who will have you know, lots of of, of questions, so I'm hoping that some sort of um, uh, public communication piece is going to be uh, part of introducing this to, to the community. I think it could be a real time saver for uh, for planning staff because there'll be lots of questions that people will just you know, be the same questions coming from uh, coming from different folks. I guess the, the the one caution is that we've seen what the uptake has been on the um, bylaw that was introduced for detached secondary suites in 2017. And if I'm remembering correctly, sort of the, the impacts there are around, what was it, down to 40 odd over a five year period, eight year? I, I can't recall, but I, I believe it's, it's less than that. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, so that's in total. Mm -hmm. So yes, we need housing. Um, yes, this will help. But this is no silver bullet. It's part of a much just part of a bigger plan. Yeah, part of a bigger Absolutely. plan. Yeah. 
and it will take time you know, for people to be able to really think through you know, whether they are, are going to do this or not because detached well, secondary suites, they're not cheap. No, they're not. They're not, they're not yeah. getting any cheaper. Either. And it's, for sure. yeah, it's the reality of that sort of thing. Then it's, uh, it'll affect people's decisions. But even, even if it's 35 or 40, that's something. You know, it's something. Yeah. And you know, the last census showed something like 270 renter households. You get 30 new detached, detached secondary suites. That's 10% yeah. of them. Yeah. That's it's not a, a large number, but it's a big jump percentage wise. Yeah. So I was supporting this. Thank you, Marty. So the recommendation. So Daniel, you're just going to draft the bylaw at this point on the basis yeah. of um, reducing the minimum lot size. And the change in the other part. And then anything that's built on the detached secondary suite is going to have, can't be an RGA. Right. So if somebody wants to have an RGA, they're going to have to apply for a rezoning and be get the commercial guest house accommodation zoning, or um, or a temporary use permit, yeah. or a temporary use permit. For, okay. Um, so I guess I mean that there's probably maybe questions asked because I know some people don't, you know, they want that second building. Now my other question is. Um, are you going to be looking at the size? I think the maximum size of the detached secondary suite is too small, especially if you're getting a big lot. Why? Well, I'm not moving into 900 square feet. You said you were moving in. A lot of people out there like a roof over their heads, believe me. No, I'm not talking about rental, but I'm, there's, the detached secondary suite in my mind solves two problems, or the, the suite in your house. One is it's a rental income. The other is the kids, your family can't afford to buy a house now, so they've got to live somewhere. Mm -hmm. So you build the laneway house or whatever, and the parents move into the laneway house. Um, but so, and so my, my question is, uh, is there any limit on the size of an accessory building that isn't the detached secondary suite? There's, a, lot coverage. there's a maximum floor area of accessory buildings. Um, that changes total depends on per accessory building or in total. It's a total floor area of accessory buildings permitted on a lot that is dependent on lot size. Yeah, so for the bigger lots, you could have an accessory building that was a workshop or a garage that was in the lot to allow for a detached secondary suite, which yep. doesn't make sense to me. Well, I, I think your maximum size should be able to be increased. If you've got a five acre lot or a 10 acre lot, why can't you have a 1500 square foot secondary suite or detached secondary? Mm -hmm. yeah. Allison, when I bring, should council proceed with the recommendation when I bring something for a first reading? I can bring a similar um, consideration as I did here on smaller lots and say, okay, what if the maximum was higher? How would that work on larger lots? Like leaving the same ratio, but just changing the maximum from yeah. 115 to something. And I can bring that as a like a discussion piece. Yeah, that's super. Yeah. Okay, so the recommendation is council directs that prepare a bylaw to amend the land use bylaw to remove the required minimum lot size for detached secondary suites and to prohibit an accessory residential use from being used as a residential guest accommodation. And can, the I ask, can I ask that that be split yes, so that I can vote for one of them? I get one of them. I guess can repeat. Can we split that up? Okay. So well, let's just do the first two. part then. The council directs that prepare a bylaw to amend the land use uh, bylaw to remove the required minimum lot size for detached secondary suites. I'll second that. Thank you. And for the discussion, I'll... Right. And make council directs that for bringing the bylaw. No, we want it severed into two votes. <clears throat> So it'd be three. There was a staff to bring the bylaw back? There's a no. third part. Okay. Councillor Morris at the bottom. Oh, do you need that in each one of them, or can we just do that at the end? I think it goes with the motion, okay. but whatever the council wants to do. Okay, okay so then we, yeah, we'll put that on the end. Of... And that Councillor X staff can bring the yeah. bylaw to a future council meeting for consideration of first reading. Okay, it's moved and seconded. It's <laughs> friendly. And no further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. 
And opposed, Sir Wynn and his Councillor Fast in opposition. And um, so the next part of it will be the council direct staff. Yeah. To prepare a bylaw to amend the land use bylaw to prohibit an accessory, accessory residential use from being used as a residential guest accommodation. Okay. And uh, I'll stop. Moment of that. Second. Second. Thank you, Dave. Okay. So all in favor? All right. And opposed? Okay. Councillor Kale, proposition. I'm sitting there. Right <laughs> Okay, so that covers that one out. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Daniel. And uh, we'll see what you come back with. I think that's really positive. Super duper job there. So we're going to go to the reports, uh, committees, uh, and commissions, see that. And um, what do we got here? Minutes of recommendations from the Eagle. Sorry, sorry, Kel, uh, sorry oh, yeah, 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 whatever. There are consideration of motions from the Committee of the Whole. There were five. Oh. So we can do those, just ratify those now. Oh, yeah, okay. Well, they have to be ratified. They're not just direction. That's typically what we do. I'm just thinking they were more direct. I just think between now and the next regular council meeting, staff will have potentially done this. So well, that's, that's that's do it now. <laughs> Compressed timeline. Yeah. So that the council yeah. ratified the motions made during the committee of the whole meeting held April 25th. The council direct staff to refer the proposed site alteration bylaw to the public open house and the environment and climate action advisory committee to the council not to develop an alternative tax question bylaw for 2022. Three, that the property tax ratios be maintained for 2022. Mm -hmm. Four, that council request additional, sorry, that the request for additional staff FDE at a cost of 89,000 not be approved at this time. Five, that the 2022 grant to tourism board island remain at 20,000. And is the right. site alteration bylaw? That was the first one I read. Yeah. Okay. I'll move that. Second. Thank you, David. All here. Okay. Yeah, let's get it. Okay. Thanks. Uh, oh, I, should, I should have been in right after the committee. <laughs> Way too far. <laughs> I think I actually had to draft the motion based on all those. <laughs> yeah. Time to draft yeah, the motion. Yeah, that's right. Okay, so back to the reports of committees, council commissions, uh, minutes, and recommendations from the Eagle Treaty System Local Advisory Committee. Mm -hmm. First one, one twenty-two. Allison, were you at that meeting? Yeah. Were you at that meeting? What meeting are we talking about? Eagle Treaty Water System. Oh, yeah. Looking at ten point four. Ten point four. Do you want me to make a motion? No. This is the, the motion about the. Uh, yeah, let's have a discussion about it before you make the motion. Which one? Council direct staff to research requirement? Yes. yes. Okay, let me get my thinking about this one. Um, We're not able to actually do that. No, we can't do it. I, well, I guess the issue. Um, it's a great idea, but it's got to be done in a different way. Yeah, I, I think what they are wanting to do is require any new construction or building permits or new connections to have rainwater capture and or storage solutions, rainwater solutions. And I did raise at the time that it's probably not something we can require at the subdivision stage or the building permit stage, but certainly has been something we have required in past years at the rezoning stage where they've got to have pervious surfaces, they've got to have rainwater catchment systems and all that sort of stuff. So or, re, or rezoning it. Well, that's what I said, at the rezoning stage, that's really the only time we can do it. That's correct. Covenant put on it. Um, so I'm quite happy to report back to the committee. That that's a great idea. We, we can't do it. Um, Thank you. And why can't we do it? Because we can't prescribe something that the building code doesn't prescribe. Yeah. Um, I'm just looking in the official community plan, and uh, policy 302 does support this. Uh, the municipality will encourage the inclusion of tanks, cisterns, and reservoirs for rainwater storage to supplement water supply 
for individual or group household use and fire protection, and that rooms be designed to accommodate rainwater collection. And I think there's some they other things there as well. That they can't make it require. But we can't require them to do that. It says encourage. Encourage <laughs> yeah. 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 So so staff are already doing that. So we're in the yeah. current subdivision that we're looking at, that's the language that we're introducing into the um, approving letter to uh, you know, yeah. to say that they're encouraged. Um, but that as Councillor Morse was stating it, it's at a rezoning where we can issue covenants that would require it. Yeah. And otherwise, we can't supersede the uh, LC building code. So, I mean, I think that's something we could certainly raise at, you know, UBCM if we were talking with ministers and things like that. And the building code is that it should be a requirement. Right. I think it's a great idea. So, uh, it's hard whether, to do. whether it's a requirement, because it's not, it's not practical for a lot of things. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. But so, maybe if, it, if, if you're single yeah. family houses on a lot of a certain size, you've got to put in. Yep. Green water capture. I don't, yeah. yeah. And I guess the other question is in areas where there are the municipal water systems, um, if we make fee time over a certain amount, then the incentive is going to be there to not either don't have the big fancy garden yeah. and use drought tolerant plants. Yeah. Or or yeah. um, get Did that already get in? Let the council I didn't. It oh. should that part two should have been in the consent agenda. Yeah, it didn't and I sorry about that. I hope I forgot to okay. Let's do that. So I move that council direct staff to include the draft EO Cook Water System 2022 2026 budget. As presented at the March 28, 2022 committee meeting in the Golden Island Municipality 2022-2026 five-year financial plan. Seconded. No further discussion. I'll ask question all the right. Perfect. Thank you. Can I, just, okay. can I just make sure that it was heard what Councillor Morris just said, which was that while we can't um, prescribe uh, rainwater capture and so forth, that we can structure our water fees in such a way as to have the costs serve as an incentive. Yeah, for which is introducing all this. All of what we want to do. Yeah. yeah, they're all pretty well keen, I think, on. Well, I'm, I'm really, I mean, we, we didn't give them what they asked for, but I am really pleased to see this coming forward from um, the uh, Eagle Club. Long overdue. Yeah. Well, I think they were. Uh, I mean, it would solve some and I, I think it, well, and at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's all about water usage, and you can collect it. But there's people that have natural gardens that don't even need to be watered, and that's even better than having kind of big tanks to collect a garden that takes up tons of water. So mm -hmm. I think there's different ways. I mean, at the end of the day, our goal is to reduce water consumption and there's different ways to do that so yeah okay so we're going to go to new business CAO update yeah what do you got thank you mayor uh just one update and um i'll, I'll provide more information because uh, this is just verbal um and it's about the metro vancouver uh i mentioned it briefly uh before um but i wanted to mention in the public room around the uh uh, destination um, marketing yeah. um, uh, campaign that is, or uh, not the campaign, sorry, the Metro Vancouver Destination Marketing Project uh, Council is taking on a project uh, in the region where they're looking for a small, medium, and large uh, members of the regional district to participate to become uh, case studies and be able to further advance their destination marketing initiatives. And so um, initial discussion with the consultant just occurred uh, the week before last. And um, I would like to pursue that a little bit further and reach out to the tourism bond uh, folks to include them in that. And then uh, I'll come back to council with more information once that uh, progresses a little further. I think that'd be fabulous. Does anybody have a problem with it? Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to say, I, I hope it's not uh, that people don't interpret this as only being about um, 
marketing because I think it's also about managing for sustainable levels of tourism and sustainable kinds of management of uh, visitor experience opportunities so that it's compatible with full island and the people that live here. And that's the kind of thing you're talking about? Yeah, very much so. Thank you, Councillor Fast. I, I should have used the term destination management rather than marketing. Yeah, thank um, you. And, uh, and we did talk about the need to improve uh, transportation on island and to the island and, and reduce congestion and, and it's not about wanting to necessarily bring much more but manage it better. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Perfect. Okay. Is that it? Uh, yes, that's it. Okay, thank you. Update to Council on Metro Vancouver Business, Metro Vancouver Director. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Katie. The only um, a meeting in the last couple of weeks or the last week or whatever it was was the um, Metro Vancouver board budget workshop and you know everybody's got the same problems of uh, having infrastructure costs that are significant and for Metro what they they tried to reduce costs for the last couple of years because of COVID but yeah. that pushed some costs yeah, yeah, down the road yeah, and yeah. the we're now stepping on the road we made more expensive and uh, <laughs> it's it's an interesting discussion. There's no easy solutions, and everybody's sort of in the same kind of situation. Thank you. Update uh, to Council on Island Trust Business. I'm Trust Municipal Trustees Fast and Kill. I'll make it very simple because I, I this week I, I have not been involved in, uh, in uh, Island Trust Business, so I'll hand it over to you. So. Sure, and I'll keep it brief. Um, just that uh, in our package, uh, 12.7. There's three items there related to the Islands Trust. Um, the first one is the legislative report. So that's just something you can read to be put out to all the planners and to Bowen Island municipalities so you can see what's changing on the provincial landscape in terms of rules and in terms of initiatives. Um, the second one there is a trust area services report. And this is uh, the part that Bowen Island municipality and uh, and Bowen citizens are most involved with. So there's a little bit of a report there. Um, and by the way, it also includes support for Ocean Watch Action Committee of uh, the Biosphere slash House Health oh, Community yeah. Forum. I don't know how that works. But anyway, that's, I've gotten. But uh, Islands Trust does support that a little bit too. So our local marine environment. And the third thing there, 12.7C, is a um, uh, an example of a way that you can uh, get your property tax lowered. Um, it's a tax exemption program if you want, sorry, it's a tax exemption program for people that want to preserve nature on their property um, past, the, uh, in the future. So even if they're a landholder now, uh, they can put a covenant on, conservation covenant on title. If, uh, for example, they want, to uh, protect the, the woodpecker forest, I think is the example uh, that I that's there. And, um, uh, and it's a program that's only available, uh, and then you get your property tax lowered uh, through the Islands Trust side so that you, uh, or through the NAPTAP program that Bowen is part of. And um, so that's a, a, a perk of being in the Islands Trust area. And uh, I just wanted to flag that for everybody that's in our package. Thank you. What's a rough reduction of taxes to the middle level if somebody did sign up for something like that? It's it, it, it's not as simple as signing up. You'd need to apply, yeah. and uh, and it would need to be um, a significant enough ecological area that staff could uh, justify putting the time into doing the covenant, which is a, a kind of legal agreement, right, yeah. that stays on title. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I don't have the information, but I'll send you a link and uh, I'll send it to all of council so that you've all got that info. Um, I didn't have it on the tip of my tongue. No yes, I think it's 65%. I think it's between 50 and 65. So it's significant. Yeah, it's like a farm tax credit. Farm tax credit. Yeah. And that's just the portion of the land. It's just the portion. It's not your house. It's just the percentage. Of it's just the, the yeah. Specific just the protected, land. the protected natural land. Yeah. Yeah. But, it, but it's something that uh, you could also be the first one for Bowen. Other islands have several. 
Um, uh, but Bowen has yet to do its very first one. So that came in uh, in the previous term. All right, thank you, Sumil. Okay, an update to Council on Metro Vancouver Regional Parks Committee meetings. Councilor Maureen Nicholson. Uh, we have not met. So we have not met. Okay, then. And update to Council on Translates Mayor Council meetings. Councilor Allison Morris. So the main announcement, and I think Sophie will have some information connections on the BIM website, but you can go to the Translink website, is the public consultation has started on the next sort of investment plan. Where's the money going to come from? Pay for things, and the um, ten-year priorities from the transportation 2050 20, plan. So, so they're they're out together on for public consultation, okay. survey, and uh, information on the Translate website. And the other, the last we met last week, and major discussion was, you know, where we're at with the consultation on that, and a report on the extension of the. Uh, UBC, the line out to UBC from Arbutus oh. and where it might go. And uh, and I gather the, I mean, part of it is you know, how it's going to fit with the Jericho land development. So yes. this is sort of a, okay, what's what's next type of report. So it's quite interesting. And, and the Jericho lands project, I think has hit the news in the last couple of weeks about it. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's another good reason for putting it out there. Well, that's that kind of is, huge. Is, is the development there, and that, so the question is sort of where's the line going to go along Kent or along to hook up with Jericho? Jericho where's the station going to be, yeah. and, and stuff like that? So there's some discussion on, on that, and how much are all the benefiting parties that are going to benefit from this line but contribute to yeah, exactly. whether it's above ground or below ground? Nothing is. Decided at this point, okay. and the okay. other just dwelling on is um, the uh, SASMAP volunteer fire department uh, trustees and fire chief and assistant fire chief came over here on Thursday and wanted to, to see our new fire hall and um, to see our old hall, they want to see that too, and the satellite hall, hall number two. And uh, I think they were all very, very impressed with. Satellite Hall number two and the new hall. Um, totally realized why we're building a new hall when they saw the old hall. And, um, and uh, yeah, it was, but it was interesting talking to them. But, uh, you know, everybody's got the infrastructure issues and all the other stuff. So I was, uh, I was yeah. on the tour also. I just did the fire on the new fire hall part because I hadn't seen it. <laughs> it's yeah. a lot. Of, and it is something. It is really, I think really. We can put the whole of the old hall inside the the, oh, yeah, just, the new one. Anyhow, it was fabulous to see it. And they were absolutely yeah. super impressed. Yeah, no, the guys did a super fun. job down there. Really, really good. And Councillor Nicholson. Yeah, yeah sorry, I'm really having trouble getting down. Yeah, thank you. Um, has there been any discussion at all of a renewal of the pilot project that we had on island some years ago? Yeah, it's, it's it's in the T twenty fifty. There is there is references in there that would would pick up that. Um, all that's been on hold because of COVID, and it just hasn't been the money or anything else to do anything other than the, the basic cluster. Yeah, so. Councillor Morris and I raised it at uh, engagement session um, of last year. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's 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 there. I made sure that there was language in the T twenty fifty that picked up that. And there's a few other areas that are interested in picking up on it as well. But they just, they just um, go look at a whole bunch of stuff on it. I'm just glad it hasn't totally gone yeah. off the no, radar. No, no. That's good to know. No, it seems a long time ago. Oh, yeah. yeah. Everything seems a long time ago. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Well, that brings, uh, that brings the meeting almost to a close. Now we have the uh, question period. And you've waited so long. Yeah. Want to try that again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, good for you. Yeah, I don't know how you did that. What a trooper. Okay, what's the question? First, I am very, uh, very disappointed that I ended up being the only one here. Yes. So we came to get the attention about our housing problem, mm -hmm. but 
Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know if that proposal came through today that was talking about on, on Facebook. There was somebody supposed to bring in the proposal, temporary allow to rent Airbnbs to as rental units and bring tiny homes in. It was on the it was on Facebook five days ago. Yeah. And I don't know, I was not hit from the beginning, so I don't know if it was brought up or not. Yeah, no, no, it, we didn't it hear about it tonight. It to on today's agenda, okay. as we were informed on, on Facebook. So uh, No, unfortunately, it wasn't on the agenda, and, and the planner isn't here anymore, so. Yeah. But uh, we welcome, we so, welcome that conversation. But everything was here. I have a couple of questions. Actually, okay. Eva, before you go ahead, um, what was on the agenda today was the revision to the secondary suites bylaw. And that is part of um, uh, what you're referring to, yeah. which is changes to the definition of permitted types of homes yeah. on, on the one. So, Things worked slowly in, in council, but what happened today was a really important step in the direction of increasing housing diversity. Yeah, it's just going for so long. No, no. And we are not getting anywhere. And as you guys know from Facebook, we are now 12 families that has to move out of the places by end of June, end of July. And there is nowhere to go. And so we were hoping that this proposal would come up today mm -hmm. and we will get a yes or no because we don't know what will happen to us by end of June. Yeah. And so I'm a bit disappointed that it still didn't came up because now we just keep stuck. Yeah. No way. The question no. mark where we will go. Because the one place that was at Artisan Square, yeah. a one bedroom for 2300 yeah. is unaffordable for a simple working person or two working adults. Yeah. You can't afford it. And then as Ansel Morse said, like she would not move into a 900 square feet. <laughs> You'd be glad to have it. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> if I were able to afford it, I would move. I was looking last week in a one bedroom suite below the Muni, those affordable yeah. housing, for 1100 and it was maybe the size of this. Oh, yeah. And I go, where should I put my two beds for my children? Yeah. Yeah. It could not fit in the bedroom, but it's the only one that I could afford. And so saying, you would never move into a 900 square feet. It's like for us, ridiculous. Or telling that the size of a secondary suite has to meet this and this size is crazy. If there is a suite, a size I can afford, I'm going to move in it. And I will be not picky about how big it is for us simple people is the price for rent we can afford or we cannot afford. So I'm sorry, but I don't agree with that. There has to be a law telling the size of a property says how big the secondary suite has to be. You know, it's gross. If I want to build a secondary suite, it's up to me and how much I will rent it out. And then the second comment to it was uh, you want to have it done by how big the lot is this is how big the detached house will be no it wouldn't have to be that size it could be whatever size but to a maximum and then the smaller eight lots will have only maximum of that size or minimum of that size if I want to build a house to give someone a home then I don't care if I'm going to look into the living room or bedroom. It will be a home where someone can live. Yeah. And I got someone asked me to bring it up today. 
that why can't you lower the size of the lot to be allowed to build a secondary housing? Apparently, the bylaw says it must be 0 0.9. Yeah. There is a lot right now, as I talked to you, is 0 0.8. And the owner is ready to build a suite on it to give home. We don't, we're, just change, we're just changing. Well, we're just changing that. That is one of the things we change are hoping to change. To be quick done because well, we need to exactly. see it can be in two years. It must be done. No, 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 no. Uh, it's, it'll happen a lot faster than two years, but it still has to There are people who have Airbnbs and they are really to put it as a rental suite. Yeah. The bylaw doesn't allow it. And so we are again on the street because we can't move into it because the Airbnb has a different law and it can be changed. Why? Well, I don't know if that's 100% correct. Well, that's Airbnb's rules, not ours. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, that's Airbnb. It's, it's, not be a, you know, it's not an it's licensed uh, Airbnb. Yeah. No, it is. And it is. I mean, like, it does it have a bow on it? Yeah, it's a bow on it. Who no, does it have a Bowen business license? Like it may not be regulation. So. I don't know, but they are not allowed to change it to a rental because there are different laws for an Airbnb, what they can put in the in the building, how many, how long it can be occupied. And if you want to change it into a residential, it needs to be totally changed. Well, that's it. So we do it the other way around. We restrict the Airbnb part of it, yeah. and because we want to open it up to long-term yeah. renters. Yeah. So, but it's it's a colossal problem, and, and like uh, we know, have to change a, a whole bunch of stuff to be able to get a combination. That's a place that would be now available. There yeah. are Airbnbs; they are ready to put it as a rental place, but they can't. Oh, I wonder if it's that's a lot. That's be an Airbnb size. thing. That's the lot size, I think. Oh, it could be. And why again a lot size? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why, why it's changed. We just are going to change the bylaw. So the lot size will be sm smaller. Is, yeah. No, no lot size. No, no lot, size. lot size required. Yeah. The other thing that um, I think Eva would be referring to is that in the same um, housing advisory committee meeting where we discussed secondary schools, yeah. we also discussed two projects. One was the um, uh, Lillet River Housing Project, yeah. which is um, with Daniel at this point. So he's prioritizing what he's bringing back to us. And then the second thing um, was temporary use permits for allowing the use of um, trailers, side by side, yeah. any kind of accommodation yeah. that you can bring exactly. into the island. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's more realistic than. Yeah, because then, like yeah. then what he was talking about to get it built for yeah. four years. Yeah. So they need right yeah. 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 right now. Yeah. I, I know we do, but it's not gonna happen tomorrow. So I know, you know but if but, it happens next month, we will uh, be happy. Oh <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I wish it could happen tomorrow next month. No, it didn't come forward. I think because there just needed to be a bit more research. Um, but it, it's um, a recommendation. From the committee. And that's the, that was the foundation thing, eh, Maureen? Or, yeah. yeah kind of eliminate the uh, foundations out of the LCD. Yeah. yeah. But that, you know, that will take a while as a process. Yeah. But, but you know, there is time two months from now or 12 times we can be on the street. Uh, it's been going on for a long time. So I need to know. If you can give them permission to live in the RV, because there are people who have campers on their land and they yeah. can't oh, I, know. I know that. So we need the permission for it. Yeah, well. It's, and then uh, what was it? Oh, uh, Kirsten, it was just for you regarding the parcel taxes. Like I saw how it is counted out, you know, good point, the co and the other side. And it's kind of caught my attention that good point is one of the cheapest ones. Where that's where the wealthiest people live. Mm -hmm. So why do they have it lower? Just partial tax 
There are people who actually we people live on the west side at the mm-hmm. higher one. Theirs is an old, old one that has been around for many, many years. Oh, and, and they don't they don't need it to buy anything. They they just have it to put it into reserves. That's all they do with it is put it into reserves. They upgraded market. their system a few years ago and it's in a much higher state of the arts system than some of the others. They got new piping and, and new equipment. So yeah, they don't because they don't use their homes so much. And no, no. the right. yeah. But they have already spent a lot of money. Years but they their problem. No, no, they were not. They already spent it to upgrade. That yeah. is why they're not having to spend so much now. They, they don't have already the made the investment. They made the investment. Yeah, because for example, now the new fire hall is great. But simple people said, why we couldn't use that place? For homes for us, and apparently, it's can't afford the building. Well, we need a fire hall. Can you afford a fire hall? Yeah, we need a fire hall for the whole island. Yes. No, that fire hall yeah. was built for the good point people that they can have injured the fire injured. Okay, well, I'm not going to get into a debate about that. Exactly. It's, it's so, silly. You don't have money to build houses for us, but you have money to build a fire hall and build a community hall. And who is going to clean it? Who is going to serve you? That's right. I know that we got a huge problem. Yeah, I know that. Yeah. And we're doing the best we can. We're doing the best we can to come up with some housing. And I hope in two months. Ah. I hope by two months. Wow. Yeah. That would you be know, nice. it's all just give the permit for those trailers and campers and the Airbnbs. And I'm pretty sure the 12 families will find home. I think the Airbnbs are already, I don't think that's our issue. I can figure it out who we should <laughs> There's nothing restricting an Airbnb from doing long-term rentals. Um, that's their choice. Yeah. There's nothing, there's no bylaw that's saying they can't do that. Okay, I'm going to refer it back to those people. Yes, please. Because, please. like, I, you know, I work at the gas station. People yeah. come and tell me, and so you, I don't know the laws. I just know what they tell me, and I'm bringing it up because there is nobody else here. <laughs> That's right. right. <laughs> right. Tell somebody on the street. Council, I think we have somebody else who'd like to speak. Yeah, I know. We're gonna. We're gonna. So I'm gonna grab that and vote for me. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Well, there we go. Well, oh, boy. Thanks, Gary. Wow, I got a question. I'm forgetting about this thing. All right, go ahead. Well, uh, good evening, councillors. Thank you. My name is Blair Johnston. Um, I uh, appreciate your time, and it's. Uh, I, I know there's never a right answer. Unfortunately, you guys can come up with the perfect solution and there's always going to be an opposed party, which is unfortunate. Um, For myself, uh, I'm a homeowner and to have a detached suite, whether it is short term or long term, I think it should be the homeowner's responsibility. We have the mortgages we have to pay. We have the property tax. We have to pay the maintenance. If we fall short of that, the city or the renters, they're not going to really help out. They can't. It's not their responsibility. Um, You know, there's been talk of possibly a tiny village with tiny homes. Uh, Builders would want to get involved with that. That's something that I'd be interested in doing. Um, So, yeah, that's, that's my comments. All right. Well, thank you very much. Anybody? Sorry, I didn't questions? catch your name. That's anything. Sorry. It's uh, Blair Johnston. Oh, hi, Blair. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. And, and again, thank you for your time, you guys. Oh, no, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Blair. Yeah. Alex. Yes. Um, How are you doing? Yeah. <laughs> Good down here. My voice is safe. Um, all right, so I just wanted to be sure I had something straight on the alternative tax collection bylaw, so that's gone now, right? Yes. Anyway, that was the one that was um, yeah. 2% in July and 8% in August. Now it's just 2 Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, and then these, um, 
recommendations or things for staff to look at? Are those coming back in two weeks or sooner? Okay. I'll have to wait the next meeting. The next meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. Monday, May 2nd, is a special council meeting to look at the budget. And so any proposed amendments need to be done by the end. Yeah, yeah. And what's the budget do? May 15th. Okay. That's a sign of the. So they're working seven days a week. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so we'll get it done. Like so we, 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 well, is, the, is we have a special council meeting scheduled for that day. Okay. It's been in your calendar for a long time. Okay. <laughs> That's why you forgot me. Well, Sorry, so we're special right. council May 2 and 12? Yes. Okay. Well, it, the May 12th, I think, was a backup date. Yeah. Oh. Okay. I think we're shooting for May 9th. Is that correct, Chris? Yeah, but we do have that. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Well, that brings it to a wrap. Thank you very much, everybody. See you. Thank you.